Uh, Rose, what's our time, Rosemary? What time do you have? It's 926. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, how's the attendance coming? Um, well, there's gradually hopping on, not very many, but Andrew Lettuce is on. Oh, hi, Andrew, how are you? And you're going to get rid of, oh, I can get rid of. There we go. I, I was muted. <laughs> Hello, I'm doing well. How are you doing, uh, Dr. Whitty? Okay, it was a very challenging summer, <laughs> <laughs> to put it yeah. mildly. Well, you guys I, have the experience to do it. To do it. Uh, I, heard, I heard that you're retiring. I am retired. You are retired, but are you going to still pop in there every once in a while? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm working for uh, JTED for, for the first uh, semester for mentoring. And I'll be uh, talking to the uh, new, new teacher about uh, summer opportunities. Oh, okay. So maybe you can be recruiting from there or we can, we can place students uh, in the program too. That's possible. No, you guys have a good program. I'll continue to advocate for you guys. <laughs> okay. So are there any urgent housekeeping questions before we start? Marlise, just let the students know that if at all possible to unmask, especially when they're doing their presentation. Absolutely, yeah. Do unmask. Okay, and everyone knows that everyone's gonna be present at everyone's presentation. Uh, and uh, this is a work day. And at lunchtime, we're gonna be showing the videos also. And it's Juan on, yes. Uh, he was on his way, so he should be here any moment. Okay. Your DRC meeting that was canceled today has mm -hmm. now been uncanceled. So I've talked to Juan and asked him to make sure he is here at four. Oh, okay. Then I'll finish. Hopefully I'll finish up uh, of Taylor's, but Taylor's isn't quite so important because it doesn't have to go out right. the same way. We just put it in uh, lymphology format. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the final presentations of the high school and undergraduate students in the Summer Institute on Medical Ignorance 2021. 
Uh, this is uh, an opportunity for our 40 year celebration of the Medical Student Research Program and the Summer Institute on Medical Ignorance, uh, which is supported by uh, several institutes of the National Institutes of Health, the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute uh, with two grants, uh, the National Institute of Neurological Diseases and Stroke, and the National Institute of Childhood and Human Development. Uh, in addition, we have uh, foundation support from the Community Foundation of Arizona, and also from the Peacock uh, a Charity Family Fund of the Triangle Community Foundation uh, of North Carolina. So this helps us support the program particularly the residential component and, and enrichment programs. Uh, we also have the support of the many teachers who participated, and we have a representative here in Andrew Lettuce from Pueblo High School, Tucson School District, which has sent the most students over our uh, history uh, to the Summer Institute on Medical Ignorance. So he, he deserves a shout out for that, but many teachers all over the state of Arizona uh, have contributed, and many of our alumni have also uh, recruited students to the program, again, from the four corners of uh, Arizona. Uh, so we're going to proceed now with the final presentations, and all of the students uh, immersed in the Summer Institute on Medical Ignorance know that all research begins with questions and ends with questions after tentative answers are often, but not always found during the research. So your presentations should begin uh, with your beginning questions and end with your final questions. Mm -hmm. And then we'll have time uh, for questions from the audience. And I hope you'll participate and don't have to be coaxed into questioning because I know you're all very prolific questioners and curiouser and curiouser uh, throughout the summer. So we're gonna begin now with the first presentation and many of the mentors will also be zooming in for their students' presentations. And the first presentation is by Al, uh, Yasmin uh, Almazan and she's an undergraduate at the University of Arizona and she worked uh, in Paolo um, Pyre's lab in physiology and also uh, with me as a co-mentor. And she's gonna do a joint presentation uh, with Vic sangster -Bai, uh, who is a high school student who's just graduated from Globe High School. Uh, and they will now present. Hello, everybody. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Yasmin Almasan. Hi, my name is Victor Singster. And my project is the effects of trip before activation in mouse superficial cervical lymphatic vessel contractility. And my project for the summer is the expression of trip before mRNA in mouse superficial cervical lymphatic vessels. Our PI was Dr. Paulo Pires, and our mentor was Felipe Pol. So a little introduction on us. Uh, like I said, my name is Yasmin Almasan. I'm a junior here at the University of Arizona and I'm majoring in molecular and cellular biology. Yeah, my name is Victor Sengstabie. I just graduated from Globe High School and I will be attending the University of Arizona as a physiology and medical science major in the fall. So some of the initial questions that I had in my project of the functional analysis of lymphatic vessels was what is pressure myography and how can it be used to trace vasoconstriction constriction and vasodilation? dilation? How does the vascular environment alter in the presence of GSK? And can similar procedures be used for the analysis of other vessels in other experimental contexts? The method that we use was pressure myography. And in this context, we were we ha harvested cannulated and tied both ends of a superficial lymphatic vessel, and it was placed under ex vivo conditions, which allowed us to manipulate the vessel's physiological environment. This technique is typically used to study blood vasculature, but in this experiment, we were able to use it for lymphatic study purposes. 
To stimulate these physiological conditions, we harvested, cannulated, and tied it. We used vessel PSS, also known as physiological saline solution, and it's used to allow the vessel to experience the same chemical environment as it would in the mouse's body. And during this procedure, the temperature is kept constant and the vessels continuously pressurized. We use a drug GSK, and trip before is our gene of interest. GSK is known as a trip before agonist. Trip before is a cationic ion channel, a mechanical sensor that responds to stretch and is heat activated. This project explores the trip before activation and the contractility effect of contractility it may have on the vessels. This experiment is exploratory, and the outcomes of these physiological reactions are to be determined. In this experiment, I created serial dilutions of GSK. Um, in a conical tube, I used 30 mils of vessel PSS, which is what we use to help simulate the environment for the vessel, make it feel normal like it was in the mouse's body, and three microliters of GSK. Then I continuously used that same sample to create other um, dilutions of it that were used throughout the experiment. Here's a visual of that. For the vascular functional analysis, these predetermined concentrations of GSK were calculated, prepared, and delivered to the ex vivo vascular system. These five concentrations of 0.1 nanomolar, 0.3 nanomolar, 1 nanomolar, 3 nanomolar, and 10 nanomolar of GSK were presented uh, to simulate the vascular system and lumen diameter trends were recorded. Throughout this experiment, we were looking for frequency, which is most important to us and most notable for research per, uh, for results for the research purposes. And this is essentially contractions per minute recorded during the controlled experiment we conducted. A secondary factor that we looked at in regards to results was ejection fraction, which is essentially the lumen area of the vessel. In this trace, we have the entirety of an experiment. This is essentially like a raw, compilation of raw data. In the beginning, for about like one sixth of the graph, that is the equilibration period as we just track and make sure that the vessel is contracting and there's no nicks in the vessel or anything of that sort. Then the five different deliveries of the dilation was throughout the experiment. And at the bottom where the dip takes place, that is where the vessel essentially collapsed when the highest concentration of GSK was delivered. And this was on a wild type mass on the second. Here I have various graphs of the zoomed in data, which were of each of the five different concentrations. The first one on the top left was like a control before we added any amounts of GSK, and then it just goes to continue down to the second, third, middle, bottom, and top. And as you can see, as the graphs progress, the frequency increases, and so does the ejection fraction. To determine the ejection fraction differences, the end diastolic and end systolic um, diameters can be looked up by the maximum and minimums of the peaks. And as you can see, as the amount of GSK um, dose increases, so does these values. Some questions that I continue to have at the end of my experiment was how can these vasoactive compounds translate to clinical care in regards to lymphatic complications? And are the research of these vasoactive constriction and dilations applicable to research of other body systems and organs? Hi. So before coming into the lab, I had some questions such as what is the GRIN1 gene and how does gel electrophoresis work? What is PCR? What techniques are used to indicate gene expression in mice? So my project for the summer was genotyping mice and genotyping is used to indicate if mice have certain gene expression. Some examples of genes that I genotyped were the GRIN1 gene and the 5XFAD. 5XFAD is the, is the model that we use for familial Alzheimer's disease. There are various steps in doing genotyping, such as DNA extraction, nanodrop tests, polymerase chain reaction, gel electrophoresis. And um, once we do, we furthermore do DNA extraction once more and gel electrophoresis, then a DNA gel extraction, then we send, send it off for sequencing to um, reassure that we have the correct gene. So the trip v 4 receptor is a mechanoreceptor. It is very permeable to calcium ions and um, GSK activates the trip v 4 receptor. It is very sensitive to heat and it contributes to lymphatic vessel constriction. And we use genotyping to understand and identify the genetic makeup of mice. The information we gather using genotyping will help us understand expressions of trip before receptors. 
So DNA extraction is a tedious process that includes using various buffers and detergents to, for example, break down extracellular matrices and to break apart the cell phospholipid bilayer, the cell membrane. And we use an ethanol, we use ethanol to create a shield around the raw DNA, which then we use centrifugal techniques to wash the DNA and um, you know, remove the shield and collect the raw DNA into an Eppendorf tube from the DNA's spin column. So the nanodrop test indicates key concentration of nucleic acids, proteins, and carbohydrates. We use this mainly to um, find mathematical values of the DNA concentration and any carbohydrate carbohydrate concentration and protein concentration. As you can see in the specific sample, this um, it includes a 4.1 nanogram per microliter DNA concentration. So the polymerase chain reaction has three main steps, denaturation, annealing, and extension. Denaturation unzips the double helix into, to create a single-stranded DNA molecule. The annealing phase occurs when primers bind to a target sequence to then prepare for the extension phase, which then polymerase uses base pairs to create single-stranded copies of DNA. And during the polymerase chain reaction, there are about 40, about 40 cycles of the same three stages. We also use gel electrophoresis. So gel electrophoresis uses electrical current to move slightly negatively charged DNA towards the positive electrode. Ores of the 2% agarose gel we use distinguishes where on the table DNA belongs based on its molecular size. So here is a gel analysis of a 5X FAD mice model. Um, as you can see here, oh, um, my mouse is not showing, but on the, you can see two, like two indicating bands, which is at 129 base pairs and 216 for sample, for columns two through six. And that basically indicates that they are heterozygous um, 5X FAD mice. Here are two gel analysis of, um, on the left, about a mixture of wild type and no wait, mutants um, of the GRIN1 gene. So mutant is the 400 base pair and that would be indicated as the lighter, um, like column two through eight have the GRIN1 mutant gene. The GRIN1 mutant is a genetic expression in mice that indicates the knockout of the NMDA receptor. And on the next gel, you can see the GRIN1 knockout. It is wild type, which means that it is basically a controlled group. And that base, you can tell by seeing that it is mostly at 232 base pairs on the gel. Here is a gel analysis of the TRPV4 receptor that we were once talking about. This is from a lymphatic tissue sample. And this indicates that it is present in lymphatic tissue such as um, lymph vessels. So gel extraction occurs after we do, we once more use the same sample to do a DNA extraction from the tissue, and then do and then once do a a gel electrophoresis once more. So after we do the gel electrophoresis, we then do a DNA gel extraction, which consists of physically cutting out the indicated band, and using detergents and buffers to degrade the gel, then bind the DNA to the gel of the DNA Z spin column. Then, similar to the DNA extraction, we wash out the DNA using various buffers and detergents. Once we do that, we detach the DNA from the gel of the spin column and 
also catch it into an Eppendorf too, as you can see on the end of this little graph, like um, animation. Afterwards, we get the sample and send it off to another lab, which then they use next generation sequencing. There are three main steps to the next generation sequencing that I would like to mention, such as the library preparation, which is when polymerase chain reaction amplifies the targeted gene sequence. Then they move on to sequencing, which is when polymerase matches designated nucleotides to gene sequences. Fluorescent molecules indicate specific sequence based on specific nucleotides. Then afterwards, a computer organizes information from fluorescent nucleotides and forms a unified DNA sequence, as you can see on the fourth step, which says bioinformatics. So some remaining questions that I have were, without DNA, how would cells generate unique characteristics relating to their functions and structure? And if lymphatic vessels have an increased permeability, can amyloid beta proteins leak through the neural lymphatic vessels? And how does the trp 4 receptors in smooth muscles compare to the function of trp 4 receptors in endothelial cells in regards to lymphatic physiology? So some acknowledgements that I would like to make are Dr. P, Dr. Pa Paulo Pires, he is our PI for the lab in physiology. So Felipe Palk was also our mentor. He helped us work with the pressure myography and the genotyping. And um, I would like to personally um, acknowledge Dr. Marlies Witte for letting us into the program and giving us the opportunity to work with Dr. P and Felipe Polk. I would like to thank Grace Wagner for the work that she's done and Grace Ann Thompson and Rosemary Alvarado. Does the audience have any questions? Okay, and I want to just mention that Felipe, who's currently a master's student uh, in physiology, was in the SEMI program last year as an undergraduate student. So he's an alumnus. Uh, you mentioned uh, Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's mice. Uh, and one of the reasons that you're looking at the lymphatic vessels is one of the ongoing hypotheses that is being worked on by investigators around the world is that there is defective uh, lymphatic drainage from the brain of proteins that are involved in causing or uh, leading to progression of Alzheimer's. And what you're doing is looking at the contractility of those lymphatics to see if that's one of the problems that uh, the lymphatic contractility is impaired. Uh, so you're focusing on a very, very hot area right now, which is the brain lymphatic system. Uh, which uh, was thought not to exist, although many in our field recognized that the brain had to have a fluid drainage system. Uh, but recently, it's become a very hot topic uh, that the lymphatics are removing all the waste. Uh, they take care of things when you sleep, they detoxify the brain, etc. And uh, this area that you're working in is a very hot area of research right now. So are there questions from the audience? Let's have a few questions. You said uh, the, the, the trip V4 uh, protein, it's, it's important in like vascular, when, like to construct constricting uh, vessels, right? So uh, what, what happens uh, in the event that, you know, someone has a defect with this protein uh, or like lacks it completely? <laughs> Uh, Vic or Yasmin, did you want to answer that? If there's an answer. <laughs> okay. Um, due to the lack of research, we're not really sure if there is a frequency in people having a lack of the trip before receptors. So it is a pretty recent topic. Okay. Are there other questions? If not, oh, okay, uh, Andrew. I, I, I just, just a question on the, uh, on the gels. Uh, if um, those gels look, look awesome. Um, do you, do you remember what kind of stain was used on those gels? Because it, they, it really looks great. Um, so we used ethidium bromide to stain the gel and then we 
put it under a UV light because ethidium bromide is very reactant to UV radiation. So then we take the picture and put it under a filter. Yeah, I never got my ethidium bromide gels to look that good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, then we're gonna move on. We wanna to keep to our schedule because mentors will be coming in and out. Uh, and our next presentation is by Brody Stevens and she's a um, student at Central High School in Phoenix. And her mentor was uh, Dr. Wei Tan who's Associate Professor in Vascular Surgery. Brody. Good morning. One second, share my screen. Okay. Can you guys see anything? Not yet, Brody. Okay. Interesting. Juan, you want to help if there's any issue? Juan, can you help here? I can help what's going on. Okay. Um, she wants to share her screen. Is Juan here? He's on, but he's not answering. Okay. Okay, try it again, Rody. Is anything showing up? I'm not yet. Can... Are you in the lab there, Brody? Are you in a lab? I'm in the innovations building. <laughs> I couldn't get into my lab this morning, but I can I can try to email it and then maybe someone else can go. So we're not wasting time. Uh, did you submit it to us? I believe. Yes. If you submitted it to us, we should have it. I'll try emailing it again. And maybe we could have someone else go. So we're not wasting time. Sorry about that. We're trying to keep to schedule. Um, let's see. Uh, we can. Will, will all the subsequent speakers please check that we have a copy of your um, your PowerPoint. So if there's any glitches, we can get it on for you. Um, we'll go on. Um, Daniel, is uh, Dr. Cowan here? Is he planning to come? Oh, he's here. Yeah, I plan so to be we, here. We can I'll go try ahead uh, with Dr. Cowan uh, here. Uh, so Daniel Moya will be our next presenter. And he's from Campo Verde, Verde High School. And he worked with uh, Steve Cowan, who's associate professor in psychology and neurosciences and a few other things, I suspect. Okay. Go ahead, Daniel. Okay, hold on, let me share my screen. Okay, you guys able to see it? We don't have it shared yet. Juan, are you there? Could you also help, please? Oh, yeah. yeah if you have Daniel. two screens, Daniel, you might be sharing the wrong screen. If you have one screen, you might be just sharing. Yeah, I'm not sure what. When you click on the share screen, it gives you a selection of what, uh, what window you want to share. So if you already have the PowerPoint open, uh, when you click share screen, um, you can select the PowerPoint window. Uh, and Juan, would you please help Brody uh, to make sure that uh, she can go next? Okay, sure. Uh, I think now it works. There we go. There, there we, we go. go. There we go. Okay, nice. Um, so, hi, my name is Daniel Moya. And this is my Summer Institute of Medical Ignorance presentation based on the effects of ketamine on Parkinsonian rat models and hippocampal involvement in shrinkage. Um, 
So I was taught by my mentors, Dr. Stephen Cowan and his two graduate students, Abhilasha Vishwanath and Gabe Ogim. And while working in Abhilasha's lab, I learned how to handle rats, build tetrodes, and practice injections. And for Gabe's lab, I kind of get, I did similar tasks. Where I just helped build tetrodes, train some of the rats, it food restrict it and handle them. And so I will first be presenting an introduction to Abhilasha's research on the effects of ketamine and Parkinsonian lab models. But then I'll be presenting on Gabe's research on the hippocampus involvement in memory. So my initial questions were, what exactly is Parkinson's disease? How is making a rat Parkinsonian beneficial? And how is it possible to make a rat Parkinsonian? So my process answering these questions began with Abulash's lab, who were mainly focused on how to treat levodopa and induce dyskinesia, using ketamine to alleviate dyskinesia. And I was able to learn that Parkinson's is a neurodegenerative disease that affects the substantia niagara, which is a subregion within the basal ganglia. And the substantia niagara, uh, niagara my bad, um, it's located within the midbrain and has a critical role in motor functions. And uh, Parkinson's is, um, affects dopamine producing neurons and causes symptoms such as uh, tremor, rigidity, and balance problems. But before a lab experiments on the rats, they had to be lesioned, which is a surgical process of injecting a toxin known as 6 hydroxy dopamine in the medial forebrain bundle to kill all the dopamine producing cells in one hemisphere of the brain. And it takes a while for the toxin to take effect. So when the toxin will take effect, it will become fully Parkinsonian. Um, so now I'm gonna move on with Gabe's research. So I'm gonna be talking about his project involving the hippocampus and some of the key terms. And but fair warning, everything I just talked about is completely different. Um, then I'm about to talk about the brain involving the hippocampus. So in Gabe's lab, I learned that the hippocampus is a complex brain structure involved in learning and episodic memory. And e vivo electrophysiology is a study of electrical signals in live behaving animals. And action potentials are when a cell fires and it occurs when sodium is running in the cell, like in layman's terms, creating an electrical pulse. And neural oscillations are the rhythmic brain waves you see in the neural recordings. So, um, uh, in game slab, we were looking to see the neural frequencies in the hippocampus while a rat's foot on a string. So here's an example. Uh, I don't know if anyone can see the video, but that's the video. And we're looking to see how these frequencies change with pulling speed. But we mainly want to know more about episodic memory in the hippocampus, such as an event in the past. Like when you're remembering your birthday or when you're hanging out with your friends, looking at, like remembering your surroundings and the people you're with. And I mentioned that neural oscillations are just said brain waves or rhythmic brain waves. So to see these brain waves, we need tetros to track the neurons in the hippocampus. Um, we perform mm -hmm. neural recordings using tetros, which are electrical wires that go into the brain. And the device on their head are called hyperdrives. And in very simple terms, it's like you can say they just hold the tetrodes, but they do a lot more. Um, while we're doing neural recordings, we are also doing fine motor tests at straight point to see at different frequencies associated with the speed that they are pulling. So we see different frequencies when the rat is pulling slower or faster. We also use a circular track that's around here. We use a circular track because we want to make sure the tetrodes are in the hippocampus and we should see a very specific brain frequency called theta. Uh, oh. There we go. So hippocampal oscillations. So the primary focus of our recordings are these oscillations. And the oscillation in this picture right here is what we predict to find in this video. I'm going to show the brain activity from the point on the string. But we still need to analyze the data to see if we're finding this specific brain, uh, this specific oscillation while they are pulling on the string. Um, so uh, my future question, so will specific cells fire when they pull the fixed length, such as a meter, such as a meter? And because I have this question, because I noticed when they would turn around, 
they will pull almost a, a meter and then look back to see if they got a treat. And uh, right here, you can see that this is around the area where they get their treat because there's that dispenser that dumps out in sure, which is what we, uh, we, what we like to give to the rats because they love sugar. And um, my second question, if the hippocampus was damaged, will the rat have trouble remembering the length of the straight pool to get a reward? And uh, for my third question, how can the string pulling test be used in Parkinson's disease research? And thank you, and that's the end of my presentation. So any questions? Let's have some questions from the audience. Um, so, so with the string pulling test, you used sugar as a, like the incentive uh, for them to pull the string. Right? What's the incentive in the in the loop to loop uh, exercise that they do? Oh wait, the loop like string pull? Is that what you're saying? Or the just the track? The track, yeah. Oh, the track. It, it's just a simple task to see if it, the they're on the hippocampus because you, when they're recording the data with the tetrodes, they will see a specific um, brain oscillation known as theta, and that's what you should see when they're running around the track, and that's how you know if you're in the hippocampus or not. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Steve, did you want to make a comment or has everything been said? I thought it was great. So yeah, uh, but the reward, the actual food reward is the same. Um, I think you, we start training the animals using honey nut Cheerios. I love those. Um, but then we switch to the insure because you can automatically dispense it with a automatic feeder and that makes everything kind of robotic. Um, but uh, yeah, nice, nice job, Daniel. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go back to Brody. Uh, Brody Stevens. Uh, Mentored by Wei Tan. Are you on board now, Brody? Yes, I am. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I'm not too familiar with Zoom if I'm being honest. Okay, so I'll go ahead and share your PowerPoint now. Thank you. All right, can we see this? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Good morning. My name is Brody Stevens. Oh. Which screen oh. do you see? We're seeing the whole PowerPoint, the whole display. Do you see the black screen and the, mm -hmm. uh, the PowerPoint on the bottom? Yes. Okay, hold on. Yes. Okay. Okay. My name is Brody Stevens. I'm a transfer to Xavier College Prep. I'm a junior. And my mentor is Dr. Tan, who specializes in endovascular surgery, vascular medicine, and vascular surgery. The study that I'm focusing on is the determinants to limb preservation in Hispanics and Native Americans with diabetic foot ulcerations. So entering the program, my knowledge to vas like the vascular system or to the study was very limited. So I was wondering what types of treatments are available to help salvage and preserve the lower extremity region? How are certain races and ethnic groups associated with the severity of individuals with hypertension? What factors may be related to the adaptation of prosthesis in patients with lower with major lower limb amputations? So before I get into everything, I want to talk a little bit about some like histology and the pathophysiological mechanisms underlying diabetic foot disease. And we see within these patients that there's a lot of peripheral neuropathy and that occurs when nerves are damaged or destroyed and can't send messages from the brain and spinal cord to the muscles, skin and other parts of the body. And then we see ischemia, which is a condition in which the blood flow, thus oxygen is restricted and reduced in a part of the body. And then we also see infection and abnormal foot biomechanics. And all of these factors are often a source of delayed wound healing and the diabetic foot doesn't function the same as a normal foot would. We also see peripheral artery disease, which is when blood vessels narrow, and it's an underlying factor of nerve damage, also known as peripheral neuropathy. And diabetic patients often don't experience pain, and they experience numbness in their lower extremities. And that's how diabetic foot ulcers form, because they're unnoticed, and they can't quite feel them and feel the pain that a diabetic foot ulcer on a normal person would. <laughs> So some statistics about diabetic foot ulcerations. 
30.3 million people in the U.S. have diabetes, and about one-third or 10 million will develop at least one diabetic foot ulcer in their lifetime. It's a very major problem within um, diabetic patients. We see that two-thirds of diabetic foot ulcers will take more than 12 months to heal, and the recurrence rate is 65% at five years. They're very recurring, and they often don't go away very quickly. And 50% of diabetic foot ulcers come infect become infected, which then turn into amputation. It's a very severe um, progression. As you can see, diabetic foot ulcers, they're very common, complex, and costly. And they're, they impact the patient's lives. You can see that they're very vile looking and they're painful and they're, we're trying to eliminate that. So we see within our at-risk diabetic patients, a lot of neuropathy, like I talked about before, structural foot abnormal abnormality, peripheral artery disease. And with these patients, they develop diabetic foot ulcers, which can either heal or go a different route. But even if they do heal, they're, they're very recurring and they come back. It's a constant battle. And if they don't heal, they get infected. And once again, they go back from being infected into semi-healing and then infection turns into limb loss. And as you can see, going down the severity, the impairment in function and quality of life and healthcare costs decreases and it's, or increases, sorry about that. Again, it gets worse and we're trying to prevent that. So you may notice that the study was called Limb Preservation in Hispanic and Native Americans. And we're focusing on Hispanic and Native American minorities because compared to other groups, Hispanic and Native Americans experience a disparate rate of diabetes, foot ulceration, and lower extremity amputation. And the prevalence of diabetic foot ulcers among Hispanics is about 8%, or not 8% 8, 8 for non-Hispanics, 8.7% for African Americans, 8.6% for Hispanics, and 9.6% for Native Americans. So we see among the minority population that it's very prevalent. And the evidence based on disparities in limb salvage among African-American whites is well described. There's many studies about the disparities and factors about African-American and whites. And a small number of studies have been focused on the Hispanic American population. And we're hoping to discover more information about this. So another thing is minorities are rapidly growing. The Hispanic population is about 16.7% the national population, and it's overtaken African Americans to become the largest minority group. And with the Native American population, about 6.7 million in the US, which is about 2% of the population are Native American, and they're projected to grow to about 10.2 million by 2060. And these minorities are younger, less educated, unemployed, uninsured, poor, and have a lower life expectancy than the overall population. So hopping into a little bit about the clinical study, our aims were to evaluate racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare access among adults with diabetes and diabetic foot ulcers. And we wanna determine the patient reported barriers to diabetic foot ulcer care and perceived risk factors related to amputations and identify predictors related to amputations among Hispanics and Native Americans with diabetic foot ulcers. And what we're aiming to do with the um, clinical recruitment, we wanna evaluate 219 Hispanic and Native Americans from Salsa UA with recently diagnosed diabetic foot ulcers and questionnaire and look at their medical record data. And they'll be used to assess clinical factors and non-clinical variables associated with amputations. And we wanna stratify the ulcer using the clinically verified wound, ischemia and foot infection, which we'll talk about later, classification system. So what we're looking for in the study or what we're observing the components, we want to determine patient-centered factors that influence the care of Hispanic Native American populations with diabetic foot ulcer. And some of these things that we're looking for are demographics, types of treatment used for diabetes, type of health insurance and deductible, past and current medical problems, history and previous amputation, diabetic foot ulcer, patient's access to doctor, where the patient lives if they live in urban or rural area, access to primary care, and the number of emergency room visits for diabetic foot ulcers, along with the number of clinic visits for diabetes and diabetic foot ulcers. So getting in a little bit, this, the data that we have, it's a very recent study and it's very preliminary. So what we have may change and it may not change. It may have certain variables. That'll be on the next slide. 
So before we get into the data, I want to talk about the Y5 wound classification, which stands for wound ischemia and foot infection. The wound, it ranks from zero to three, zero being less severe, no ulcer, no gangrene, three being very extensive and um, very extensive ulcer or gangrene. And for ischemia, we want, we ideally want um, greater than 60. And if the toe pressure is lower, then they're not getting enough blood flow. And that ranks zero to three, getting more severe. For foot infection, we have zero to three, zero being non-infected, three being severe. And then you can see that on the right more in case. And then we have our clinical stages, which of course, one to four, they get progressively worse. And clinical stage five would signify an unsalvageable foot. So I'm not gonna go through everything because I don't wanna bore you guys with <laughs> all of this information. But what I do wanna point out is that the average age was 59.3 with a standard deviation of 11.6. We did, um, we have 19 patients enrolled. So all of these statistics are based off those 19 patients. It's very preliminary. We saw that majority was male. And for the race, we're of course focusing on Native American, Hispanic. And even though non-Hispanic has the greatest amount, we, we're assuming that's gonna change and even Hispanic has a great um, percentage. We see that a lot of these patients have hypertension, chronic kidney disease, and peripheral artery disease, which is one of their main comorbidities. Um, we see that they're also very obese. They have a BMI of 34.6 average with a standard deviation of 6.8. And a lot of them have previous diabetic foot ulcers. We also saw that incision and drainage, that was their procedure history, had the greatest, um, like amount of people. And a lot of them also had toe amputations as well. For the medications, they're taking just standard medications, insulin, oral medicine, statins, anticoagulations. And we also noticed that, or we're looking for, they're all 35 to 76 years of age. They all had type two diabetes. They all have active foot ulcers and ulcers were less than six months old. That's constant and not changing. We see getting into more about the data that the patients that we went over, they have moderate to low foot Wi-Fi wound scores. So they're not too bad. We see that 0% have score three, that's good. We also noticed so far that none of them have ischemia. And for the Wi-Fi infection score, we see that 42.1% have infection too, that's quite moderate. And we see that for the clinical stage, most of them had low to moderate, um, 47.4% and 26.3%. For the surveys that we conducted that were more factor-based, we saw, we asked, do you check your feet? An average of 5.3 and 10.5% said three times a week, and I don't check my feet. And when we, what we noticed with that is that those patients that don't check their feet quite often have um, more extensive foot ulcers and they're more severe. And those patients that we asked difficulties going to doctor appointments. If they don't, they're usually, they're about the same as if they do. But for the ones that do, we see that the finances and transportation was an issue. And especially with transportation, we see that those foot ulcers are quite extensive. For the question, how long do your ulcers last? We see that patients who said, this is my first one, about 31.6%, they have pretty severe um, foot ulcers, extensive foot ulcers, and one to two months or three to four months also have extensive foot ulcers. So we, we're predicting that this may be a factor in ulcer severity and something that we can hopefully present or prevent. When we ask who usually finds your ulcer, we noticed that the family or doctor had higher percentages and they were also um, more extensive. So that may be a factor as well. For the fringe benefits that things that I've gained the summer and benefit. As you can see from the picture on the right, I was in the OR a lot and my exposure to the surgical world through observation in the OR increased and it was amazing. My, I was constantly expanding my knowledge. My questioning process got much more complex than it was before. And my opportunity to review landmark and current medical literation, develop critical appraisal skills and discuss clinical applications using evidence-based medicine occurred in Journal Club, which is something that I took to um, increase my like questioning skills. 
Some remaining questions that I have are how can we improve access to proper healthcare within lower income areas and areas of vulnerability? And given insight regarding clinical and non-clinical factors of lower extremity amputation, how can we widely enforce prevention techniques? I hope to learn more about these questions and answer them through further participation in the study. Um, also, I'd like to acknowledge my mentors, Dr. Tan, Adelina, and Jennifer, who were always helping me throughout this entire process. And of course, the SEMI staff for making this all happen and making everything run as smooth as possible. And if anyone has any questions, you can email me, feel free to email or even text me or ask right now. <laughs> And that's it. <laughs> okay, th thank you, Brody. This this was part of a uh, multi-year study that has really just begun, supported yeah. by NIH. And one of your students, Adelina, is also in the Summer Institute. She's a medical student mm -hmm. working with Dr. Tan, and she'll be doing the research distinction track as well. And hopefully you'll keep up with this uh, this very uh, complex, interesting study. Are there any, one single question? from somebody who hasn't asked a question before, if possible. How about a question? A question. Okay, go ahead on the what, top. What non-clinical factors do you think impact the development of the diabetic ulcers or like public health? <laughs> You're good. Um, so we're thinking like with the survey questions we asked like, um, do you have trouble getting to like clinics or like maybe even like their diet or just like lifestyle um, factors that we hope to like find commodities and kind of prevent these amputations based off of how they live, how, how much trouble they're getting to like, even like financial issues, tra transportation issues, like things that we can fix and make easier to um, make the foot ulceration less severe as possible. Okay. Uh, is Dr. Tan here or is he operating today? Maybe operating. <laughs> I think this is his operation day. Okay, we're going to move on. We're a little behind, but we're not too bad. Uh, we're going to go back to Dr. Cowan's uh, uh, next half, and that's Valeria, uh, Valeria Pe uh, Pezos, and she's from Flowing Wells High School here in Tucson. Go ahead, Valeria. Can everyone hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Hi, good morning. My name is Valeria Pasos. Uh, as Dr. Woody mentioned, I'm a rising junior at Flowing Wells High School here in Tucson, Arizona. My lab mentors that I got to work with this summer are Dr. Stephen Cowan, and I got to also work with the, his graduate students, Abhilasha Vishwanath and Gable Geen. And our lab was on Parkinson's disease and the effects of ketamine and levodopa-induced dyskinesias. My initial questions were, what is Parkinson's disease? What is levodopa's function for people with Parkinson's disease? How does dopamine affect memory? And what is the neurological effect of ketamine? For some background on Parkinson's disease and levodopa-induced dyskinesias, Parkinson's disease is a progressive neurodegenerative disease. It involves the loss of dopaminergic cells in the brain. Dopamine is very important um, to the brain because it uh, controls motor function and it's also associated with the feelings of reward, pleasure, motivation, and it also aids in concentration. So people with Parkinson's disease often have movement abnormalities that can be seen as very slow lethargic movements, tremor, rigidity. People often have problems with their balance and their gait. And there's also cognitive deficiencies. So people suffer from uh, depression, sleep disorders, memory loss that can even go to the extremes of dementia. Uh, the one, as we can see on this graph right here, um, in a healthy patient, these dopaminergic cells are producing and expressing uh, tons of dopamine. In a Parkinson's patient, uh, we see the reduction of dopamine in these cells. 
there is one very effective treatment for Parkinson's disease, and that is levodopa. Levodopa is a precursor to dopamine, but there is a very big downside to levodopa, and that is that um, after a very prolonged use, usually about five to 10 years, people begin um, to have what is clinically known as levodopa-induced dyskinesias. Dys uh, levodopa-induced dyskinesias can be seen um, as jerking, twisting, squirming, limbs flailing, and they are involuntary and uncontrollable. So these uh, patients who have taken levodopa for a very long period of time uh, struggle with these movement abnormalities. So the progress that we made in the lab um, to answer my questions and for a little bit more background, uh, lesioning, which is basically making a rat Parkinsonian. We work with 6-hydroxydopamine, uh, also known as 6-ODA, which targets DAT transporters specific to dopamine producing cells and it kills them. So if we can see on this, uh, I guess I could point to it. This graph right here, um, this toxin is being injected into the medial forebrain bundle and it moves into the substantia nigra in the brain, which is where all dopamine is produced. Um, this makes rats Parkinsonian. Um, it usually only happens in one hemisphere. We did also did neural recordings. In these neural recordings, we um, connected rats to an implant that is placed on their heads and through a software uh, we can monitor and later analyze uh, brain activity in real time. It is known as in vivo electrophysiology. So during these neural recordings, it is um, a long period of time and uh, the rats are given a period of time where it's just them and their basic uh, activity level at a basic Parkinsonian activity level, then they are injected levodopa, which induces dyskinesia, and then they are injected ketamine. And the entire point of this lab is to see how ketamine works against these levodopa-induced dyskinesias. For a little bit of background on ketamine, ketamine is an anesthetic in the medical field. And it is usually used in veterinary patients, so animals, but it is also used recreationally to get high. And it is a dissociative drug that causes uh, visual and auditory distortion, detachment from reality, and uh, feelings of happiness or uh, being relaxed. Um, ketamine seems to reduce neural signatures in the brain that occur during levodopa-induced dyskinesias that seem to reduce behavioral symptoms of uh, these dyskinesias. So that is what our lab is looking for because it is very unknown why ketamine is, in specific, is what ketamine is doing in the brain to reduce these behavioral symptoms of levodopa-induced dyskinesias. Some other things that we did in the lab were training. Um, Daniel talked a little bit about how we train them to string pull and to run around a track. Um, so we worked with the rats again with the same uh, in vivo electrophysiology we use in the neuro recordings. They are attached to the software and we can analyze and monitor in real time the brain activity as they are doing these exercises. At the very end, very, very end of uh, research, I, we got to hear a little bit about this what um, is our perfusions. And perfusions are basically in short where the brain is taken out of the rat and it is um, preserved. Then it is sliced into very thin slices and uh, stained with tyrosine hydroxylase, which stains for dopamine. And this is basically evidence for all of the data that comes from this rat. Um, in these, uh, in this graphic, graphic right here, we can see that the right hemisphere, which was the lesion hemisphere in this rat, is white. That means that there's zero presence of dopamine cells in this hemisphere. And on the left, there it's brown, which means that there's dopamine cells in this um, hemisphere. My remaining questions are, are there risk factors for Parkinson's disease patients that put them at higher risk for levodopa-induced dyskinesia? 
How do levodopa induced dyskinesias affect the brain in the long term? How can we prevent damage to dopaminergic cells? How can we analyze brain activity in relations to certain neural disorders? What are the long term effects of ketamine use to alleviate levodopa induced dyskinesias? And finally, what aspects of drugs affect neuron communication the most? Um, so now it's time for questions or comments. So if anyone has anything to say. Hey, let's have a question, preferably from someone who hasn't asked a question. Uh, have you guys found any side effects of ketamine? Um, not, not that we we saw in the lab. Um, sometimes ketamine seemed to not work in the lab, and those were days where our recordings just failed. But really, we haven't really seen anything except the behavioral side aspect of ketamine, which is um, we often seen in the rats just like flopping around. Um, but it's a way less uh, it's way less agitated than when the rats are just kinetic. So that's how we could tell it, it reduces a dyskinesia. Thank you, Valeria. Steve, do you have a comment that you want to make? Oh, great job, Valeria. Yeah. Um, right. So we we look at some of the neural signatures of ketamine and, and there are a lot of these brain oscillations or brain waves that are produced in dyskinesia. And they're essentially repeating patterns of neural activity. And we're finding that ketamine disrupts those patterns of brain activity, and we're thinking that's the mechanism by which some of these dyskinesias are reduced. Um, and so that's one thing we're looking at. Um, there are other long-term effects. The question about side effects is a good one. Um, in the media term, ketamine has very strong effects on the brain and behavior, just like Valeria was saying. Um, but then if you look at the animals a day, two days later, or humans a day or two days later, it's hard to find any residual um, <clears throat> side effects uh, from the drug. So it's a relatively safe um, treatment compared to perhaps others. So, um, so anyway, just a little thing to add, but yeah, nice job, Larry. Okay, will everyone who doesn't have their video on turn your videos on now? So all the students should have their videos on. That is all of you, no exceptions. All videos should be on throughout this whole uh, proceedings. Okay, we're gonna go on to Alina uh, Marine from Catalina High School. Uh, and she worked with Dr. Zagul, uh, who's assistant professor in the pediatrics department. Can you see my screen? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Hello, good morning. My name is Alina Marine, and I'm going into my senior year at Catalina Foothills High School. And this summer I worked in the neonatology labs under Dr. Mohamed Ahmed, Dr. Nala Zagul, Dr. Akash Gupta, Maricela Rodriguez, and Ian Roberts. Some background information first on neonatology. Um, neonatology is the research and care of infants, particularly ones born ill or premature. Now, since there are two doctors in my labs, we have two projects going on. One relating to pulmonary hypertension, typically hypoxia induced, is Dr. Ahmed's project. He's looking for, he's, he's researching and developing a, cure, uh, a new gene therapy for pulmonary hypertension. And Dr. Zagul's project is using the hormone allopregnolone to attempt to reduce hypoxia induced brain damage in neonates. Some of the questions I began with um, this summer was, how do you find the function of a gene? I thought the project relating to pulmonary hypertension was really interesting because I'd never heard of anyone trying to treat a disease with a specific gene. And I thought that was really, really neat. And I wanted to know how it happened. Another question I had was, how do you transfer disease models in mice to treatment in humans? And the short answer I found was just, eventually we're gonna do lots of clinical trials and then my third question is more of an ethical question. It's when does science go too far? Um, so here's some pictures. So pulmonary hypertension, um, a little more detail on pulmonary hypertension uh, is 
Um, the disease is defined as, um, it, it's defined by arterial pressure of 25 millimeters of mercury or higher. And it is a disease that affects um, the right side of your heart and the arteries in your lungs. Um, and as you can see from the image, the pulmonary arteries become narrowed because of the hypertension, which is what increases the pressure. And the gene of interest that we're looking into to try to reduce the pressure through vasorelaxation is the CHAT gene, which stands for, CHAT stands for choline acetyltransferase. And it creates a protein called um, acetylcholine. And that is believed, there's a possibility that it could be linked to the vasorelaxation relax needed to reduce the effects of pulmonary hypertension. So pathology slide. Um, this image is on hypoxia. Hypoxia is a condition where there is low oxygen in the body and it is one of the things that can cause pulmonary hypertension. It um, is really not a great thing. It can have really bad effects in the brain and other parts of the body. If you look at the picture, you can also see that surrounding the vessel are endothelial and smooth muscle cells which are two places that Maricela, who works in the lab, has been looking for um, chat, the chat gene and its expression. Um, so paraventricular leukomalacia. Para paraventricular leukomalacia is a horrible, horrible thing. Um, it's it can be characterized by uh, white matter necronic lesions and uh, neuronal death. Um, some of the effects of the damage are um, cerebral palsy and other developmental disabilities and cognitive and motor function issues. Um, and it can be caused by hypoxia ischemia. The lack of oxygen in the brain is what does the damage. And this hormone allopregnolone, which is a neuroprotective hormone that has been in the past used to lessen the effects of postpartum depression is um, what Dr. Zagul is working on and researching to see if it can be used to reverse the effects of paraventricular leukomalacia in infants. Mouse genotyping. We've been genotyping a lot of mice. Uh, this is something I learned this summer and I had no idea about. Um, and this is how I answered the question, how do you find the function of a gene? You get rid of it. You knock it out of the mouse. Once you create a disease model in a mouse, you then get rid of the gene to see how the disease reacts and changes based on the absence of the gene, to tell whether the gene is helping lessen the effects of the disease or if it's making it worse. So then you can further analyze its function. Some things I learned to do along the way were polymerase uh, chain reaction experiments and Western blood experiments, plasmid quantif quantification, and CRISPR technology. We're not really doing any CRISPR technology in the lab, but um, Dr. Akash thought it was very important that I be well-rounded in the things that I was researching. And I thought this uh, was a really, really interesting um, technology. So more on that later. Um, these are the results of a PCR I ran. As you can see, the top slide is a key that was made by Ian Robbins, who works in the lab. And those are the four types of reactions we were running. We used the polymerase chain reaction experiment to um, help us genotype the mice so that we can um, understand its genetic composition and what um, genes it has and what genes are being expressed. Um, and we ran one for chat wild type, chat mutant, create, and a positive control. And those are my results. They're a little hard to see, but they are the clearest ones I got. Um, we also ran Western blots to detect and quantify protein. Um, this is detecting the protein beta actin, which is a structural protein that can be found in every cell type. So it's a really good positive control. Um, this is the plasmid size that we ran. We wanted to make sure that uh, they were the size that they were supposed to be, and they were, with um, BCM B6 AP chat GFP being at 8.4 kilobase pairs, um, PNL 2.1 promoterless being at 4.7 kilobase pairs and pcmv 6 apgfp being at 6.6 .6 kilobase pairs. CRISPR-Cas9. 
Um, I think this is a really, really neat tool. CRISPR, so CRISPR stands for clustered, um, clustered regular, regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. And um, Jennifer Dudna and Emmanuel uh, Charpentier uh, won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for it this year because it is a really, um, it's an amazing new technology. It, uh, it started out as almost like genetic scissors um, where you could snip out a piece of coding in the genetic um, region of your interest, but now it has sort of evolved into a multifunctional tool where you can both insert and delete um, specific areas of genetic code. And I think that could really change the world. And I think that's really groovy. And it kind of gets into my um, question of when does science go too far? Because currently the use of CRISPR-Cas9 on humans is illegal, but that hasn't stopped everyone. And honestly, it reminds me of the movie Gattaca because how could that, like it's science fiction coming true. How could CRISPR-Cas9 change our society? I think, I think it could do some really amazing things. Um, some of the questions I remain, the questions I still have uh, pertain to the lab questions. I really want to know, can chat be used as a rax or relaxant to um, lessen the effects of pulmonary hypertension? Can allopregnolone reverse the effects of preventricular leukomalacia? Um, so I'll have to keep up sadly, even though I'm leaving the lab, because I, I would really, I would really like to know the answers. Um, I plan to continue to foster my curiosity, ask even more questions, and keep up on the new research coming out. I think this has been a really great opportunity for me to nurture that inquisitive like inner child. And it's been um, really, really nifty. Um, some acknowledgements I'd, <laughs> acknowledgements I'd like to make are to everyone working in the lab with me, Dr. Mohamed Ahmed, Dr. Nala Zagul, Dr. Akash Gupta, Maricela Rodriguez, and Ian Robbins, who mentored me all summer and were so, so amazing and helped me learn so much. And I would like to thank Rebecca King and Jed Bader for doing all this right along with me as other students in the lab. And I would like to thank everyone who is in charge of the SIMI program, Dr. Woody, Juan, Grace Ann, Rosemary, Grace, uh, Grace Thompson. Thank you so much for um, making this possible. I learned so much. Here's some citations for my images. Questions? At least one question. So what's your opinion on gene editing? Um, I think it could be really beneficial, but I also think that if we get to a place, which I don't foresee happening, um, even in the next century, where you're able to, and Jennifer Dudna, Dudna does talk about this a little bit in her TED Talk, which was really cool, but um, if we get to a place where we are editing humans to create, like, advanced people, people with desired traits, people who are healthier, people who are stronger, people with higher IQs. I think it could, um, I think it could really lead to a much larger class divide in the country because um, it's hard enough as it is for people from lower income families to um, climb the social ladder. And only, only people with a lot of money are gonna be able to afford these um, alterations. And I think it could cause a lot of problems um, so yeah, that's my answer. I have another question, if mm -hmm. I may. Um, so you said that you don't see this happening within the next century. Have you heard about how in China they have already used a lot of CRISPR and gene editing to even create uh, twins and other types of uh, you know children that you know come from higher class families and, and a lot maybe maybe smarter than others. I heard a little bit about it, but I know, I don't think it's gonna become like a worldwide thing while the technologies are so new. And I don't think, it, at least here, I don't think it's gonna become common enough of a thing to become a big problem um, anytime soon, but it could happen sooner than in the next century. Uh, that wouldn't surprise me either. Thank you. The next century being the 21st century. <laughs> perhaps, uh, depending when you say worldwide, uh, other countries uh, are not constrained by the ethical guidelines that uh, we might impose. So uh, it might be a free-for-all on, uh, on some of these issues. 
you certainly bring up uh, very important points. Uh, okay, we're going to go on to Anaya Noriega from Sal Point High School, uh, who worked with uh, Lourdes Castanon in surgery. Are you uh, working uh, together? Uh, may, could I just uh, could I just ask whether uh, your mentors are here? Um, uh, um, our mentor isn't here. Um, Alina, no, Alina, uh, were, were your mentors here? Yes, I know I saw, I know I saw Maricela and I know I saw Dr. Zagul and, um, yeah. Did they want to make a comment at all? Uh, if not, uh, uh, yeah, I think, uh, this is, uh, Dr. Zagul. I think Alina did a great job, uh, in her presentation, um, and she um, has done a lot in the lab and really did a good job. I hope she comes back next year. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're, we're gonna go on. And Juan, as you put this editing together, uh, make sure that the two presentations for Dr. Cowan's lab go together since we interpose Brody there. Sure. Uh, and the same would be true. I don't think we have to do too much editing. Things are really going very smoothly, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna go on then to Anaya Noriega. She's uh, presenting with Isabella. They're both oh, presenting together. Also with Isabella Espinosa, from, who's an undergraduate from the U uh, University of Arizona. All right, can everyone see our screen? Yes. Great. There you go. Um, hello, my name is Isabella Espinosa, and this is Amaya Noriega. Um, our project this summer is titled PI in the Burn Clinic. PI stands for Performance, Improvement, and Efficiency. So our project is a little bit different in that it's um, based on quality improvement. And we worked this summer under Dr. Lourdes Castañón and uh, Tanya Naim. So some of the big questions or our beginning questions are, how does the staff and how do the patients and the staff feel about the clinic? And how can the issues of the clinic be improved for future functionality? Um, some of our other questions was why the clinic was open for two days, considering that a lot of people had issues with that two day availability. Um, and do both sides of the issue of um, the problems are, do they go both ways between the, the patients that are in the clinic and the staff that are experiencing the issues in the clinic? And why does admin assign a time limit, which is 10 minutes to each of its patients when it clearly takes very much longer than 10 minutes? So the part of our um, project is based off the backgrounds and conditions of the clinic, the staff and the equipment that's in the clinic. So um, within the staff, there's only about six to eight staff in one clinic day, and there's an average of about 20 patients between the times of nine and 12 o'clock, depending on when the clinic starts, which eight um, staff members doesn't seem like a lot for 20 days. It's um, very much a larger patient to staff ratio. Definitely not great, and it's really um, shown in our data later. Um, but in total, there's 13 to 14 staff total that, um, interchange between the different staff days. There's limited equipment within the clinic. There's only one procedure table and four rooms available um, each clinic day for um, the burn clinic. Um, there's only one procedure table, which people who are in wheelchairs and especially don't have the movement because of their extensive burns, they need the procedure tables, but when there's only one available, there's very much clogging that happens um, and patients that need to wait for that table or that room to be available so they can change into that room. Just very much um, lack of equipment. There's also no tub rooms, which a tub room is a, a room that like has a tub that um, has a water system that helps to clean down wounds. So for patients that are going to the burn clinic for a dressing change, they don't have that tub room. So we use the mini tubs um, with just like water in it, which isn't very, um, the best care that can be provided for the patient. And then in the overall clinic, like I mentioned, there's not enough rooms available for 20 patients a day, only four rooms. Um, and then they only have 10 minute time slots, which also it, um, has clogging and very much um, hinders the 
efficiency and the quality that can be given to patients in the clinic? Um, so the big questions for our lab, so our lab's main question is, how do we make treatment for burn patients better? And then the main questions for our project are, how can the quality efficiency of the clinic be improved? What is the main root of all the issues in the clinic causing dissatisfaction in both the patients and um, staff? And how can we improve the clinic for both staff and patients? So the goals of our project were to overall find a way to improve the clinic, as we have mentioned, um, and to find where the source of issues is coming from, whether that be within the limited resources and the limited actions or constraints on the staff and the clinic. For example, the 10 minute time slots, the room unavailability and things like that. And to overall um, and like give suggestions about what could be fixed to improve the workplace and the patient care. Um, so some barriers we, we encountered at the beginning of our summer um, and um, in, our, in our project. So at the very beginning of the summer, it was extremely difficult to actually get into the clinic because um, it was kind of like jumping through a lot of hoops. We had to get TB tested and there was a lot of emails falling through. So that limited the number of days that we were able to actually go to the clinic and observe. And something else that happens when you do um, surveys is when you call people, no one really wants to answer. So we had a lot of trouble getting um, people to answer the phone or convincing them that our survey wasn't um, too much of a time uh, constraint on whatever was going on in their day. And then sometimes we got patients who um, would answer the phone and were willing to participate, except they were extremely confused and were not answering um, specifically for the burn clinic. So they might be someone that has um, been to many different clinics um, through the banner system. And they would answer for an example, being like in the gastroenterology clinic rather than the burn clinic. So we couldn't really use that data. Or they would um, think we were talking about the hospital. And so we couldn't really use that data um, to clarify what we needed to happen in the clinic. So um, as you mentioned, our data consists of objective and subjective, the subjective part being surveys and the data being our time collection. So um, our objective data was basically us in the clinic itself during the five days that we were able to be in the clinic, which is approximately 26 hours. Um, we were there following a patient from when they checked in to when they checked out. And we had a stopwatch available with us like on our phones and when they checked in, when they said, hello, I'm here for an appointment, we would start our time. And then when they were waiting, we would lap it. And when they got called back, we would also lap it. Lap it every single time something happened. So we mainly did um, waiting room times, vitals, um, the time they were in the examination room alone, time with nurse, resident, doctor, um, when they entered and exited the room, and then when they leave to when they checked out. Um, so that was our clinic throughput. Um, it shows the times of the appointments, so the information we were collecting for the objective part was to see if patients uh, um, patients really did last in the time slots that they were given. So if they were scheduled for an appointment at 1030 and they were given a 10 minute time slot, um, it would show that the patient and the clinic needs a lot more time than the 10 minutes available to them. It shows the possible issues. So if let's say checkout takes a long time, we can um, go into it and look at it and see what's happening at checkout that takes a lot more time than what's happening per se if they were being um, doing vitals. Like why does vitals faster? And why is checkout faster for another person than it is for this person? So just things like that. And overall it gives us an average of the um, patient time appointment. So our data for the subjective part portion of our um, project was the surveys. We asked for staff and patient surveys so we can get their opinions and their experiences within the clinic. Um, it showed, we asked a total of 46 surveys. So all the data that you will see is based off 46 surveys for patients. And we got 11 staff surveys completed. So 46 for patients, 11 for staff. Our objective data was based off um, 20 times collected from a clinic. So we followed through 20 appointments. Um, but for our subjective data, it shows the opinions from the staff and the patients showed the subtle issues within the clinic, 
So what are issues that we probably didn't think about what's happening in the clinic? So we're mainly looking at time and trying to show why the 10 minute slots aren't enough and it, that it causes stress on the staff and that the patients are also in turn being affected by that 10 minute slot. But um, we also have learned that it's many more issues that also contribute to the patient insatisfaction and staff um, stress. And it also shows um, what's working well in the clinic. So the patients um, gave very positive input about what's not working and what is working, which is very valuable to the clinic overall. Um, so here's actually some of the data that we got from our surveys. Our very first question on our patient survey um, is, is it easy to keep in contact with the clinic? And we can see here that 19 out of the 46 people said, yes, it is really easy to keep in contact with the clinic. And then 18 said no. So what that tells us is that it's kind of a hit or miss with um, being able to contact the clinic, right? And that's not good because if someone has questions about their wound dressings or questions about rescheduling an appointment, um, they can't get a hold of the clinic, right? And um, this not available portion here, that's most often when people say, oh, I didn't really have a need to contact the clinic outside of my appointment. So I'm not really sure if it's easy to contact. And then yes and no was when someone would try one mode of communication. So say they would use um, the phone and uh, try to call the clinic and then that didn't work. Um, they would alternatively use email to contact the clinic and that would work better. So we have that, which means um, overall, it's kind of difficult to contact the clinic because we have such close numbers between um, the yes and no. Um, here's another uh, data collection from the patient surveys, which was um, we wanted to see how patients were perceiving their own appointments. So how long is your appointment from start to, to finish? So from the moment you walk in and check in to the moment you get to leave. And right here we can see that um, it's overwhelmingly this 30 minute to one hour mark. Um, 19 people answered that their appointment was about 30 minutes to an hour. However, um, again, when actually uh, scheduling for the clinic, the appointment slots are 10 minutes long. So this is telling us um, that on average, patients feel that their appointments are three to six times longer than they're actually scheduled for, which is um, obviously very, very um, stressful to the staff. They're giving this um, almost unattainable goal, right? And then we can see that there's also patients who have been there for more than two hours. And that's really, really long to have um, a checkup appointment. So uh, that was our patient surveys. This is our staff surveys. So we asked a question of how on a scale of one to five, how would you rate the communication? So between the staff, not between like staff and patient, just between the staff. And half of them answered um, that a three or a two, nobody answered a one, which is great, but a three or a two still, that shows that it was, um, there's still some lacking of communication that they see happening. So when we asked them to explain, we found that the communication um, was very difficult between the RNs and the doctors. There's medical students that are in the clinic and they themselves don't know what's necessarily happening since they don't really have that experience yet. And um, it's just another um, lack of communication between um, the RNs and the students. And then the doctors and the RNs have difficulty communicating because you may not, we've noticed when we were observing in the clinic that the doctors just go into room to room and the nurses have time um, difficulties knowing what rooms they're in along with the students. So the next two questions, um, question seven and six that we asked were about the obstacles and the setbacks that they experience in the clinic. So um, when we asked them to elaborate, they said their obstacles were um, that the patient to volume staff ratio was very big, it's too big. You can't have eight staff members and there'd be 20 patients at a time. Um, dressing changes, they said, take the most time, which is why they think that, or why they say the appointments are taking much longer than they're supposed to. Um, and that the amount of patients that are scheduled within like a day, um, 20, also adding on, relating back to the staff and the patient volume is too big. There's 20 appointments for about four hours. Um, 
and the distance from the hospital to the clinic, which is an issue we didn't think about. But um, the you have to go to a different place to go to the burn clinic. And if it was at the hospital, then there would be more resources, um, like the rooms and supplies available for dressing care for patients, along with the doctors not having to drive um, one or like the staff having to go from the hospital to the clinic itself, which we've noticed some doc the doctors arrive late sometimes because they may be held up by a surgery or by rounds, which they're completing at the hospital and has to be done at um, the burn clinic. So along with um, the rest of our staff um, questions, question number four, we ask them how long they think they spend with an average person. Um, just like how we ask the patients how long they think they spend with like, the doctor. So um, they responded that they think they spend around a 20, a 10 to 20 minute range um, with the patient, which is the majority of um, the grand total of service that we ask. So when we look at the data later that um, of the clinic times and averages, we can pinpoint how much time they really spend with it. So they think they spend around 10 to 20 minutes when actually they may spend less or more time. So what's happening between if an appointment, they say is about 30 to an hour and they spend 10 to 20 minutes with the patient, what's happening between those other minutes. And then um, we also asked them, are the time slots for each patient adequate since that was the main portion we were trying to prove? And um, of course, most of the staff said no, because it really isn't. As we will show later with um, the clinic data, um, each patient has, or each appointment that goes over 10 minutes, which most of them do, and almost all of them do actually, um, it's definitely not enough to have dressing changes um, and check in and check out done within 10 minutes. Dressing changes for also depends on the wound that a patient has, but dressing changes take or anywhere from 30 or 15 to like 45 minutes just to unwrap and to put on the dressings again. Then having to explain how to take care of the dressings also takes additional time on top of the appointment because that care is equally as important as um, making sure the patient is um, fully dressed and um, has good healing process. And then check out and check in are another part that has to be fit within those 10 minutes. So that 10 minute range is definitely not enough. Okay, so I'm sure you're curious as to what actually happened in the clinic. So through our observational data, we've got um, a couple of data points here. Um, this one in the table style with the blue top is the actual recordings of some of the time. So you can see here, this one was 30 minute, 39 minutes and 38 seconds, right? And then we have uh, what, 83 milliseconds. And so we took the, in, the total time for each appointment, right? And as you can kind of go down and see, um, there are none that are 10 minutes long. So that is really, really outrageous. Um, and then they were rounded to the nearest whole minute, right? And then we averaged them. So on average, a patient's appointment is around 57 minutes long. So almost six times longer than the um, time slot they're allowed, right? And then um, how are patients actually spending, um, where are they actually spending their time during their appointment? Right. So we took the average percent of time spent in different parts of their appointment. Um, and we found that 43% of a patient's appointment is actually spent waiting. So whether that's waiting in the waiting room or waiting in the exam room all by themselves, um, that's where they're spending most of their time. And they're only spending about 15% of their time with the doctor and 13% with the nurse. And then we also have this strange um, check in and check out time being relatively high as well. So this 12%, um, I just wonder what's going on that people are not checking out. Um, that checkout is such a large portion of their uh, appointment, right? So um, we asked what patients disliked and liked about the clinic. What they liked was the staff. There was such a positive review about the staff that they explained that they were very caring, knowledgeable, organized, optimistic, and they love um, the staff overall. The main issues that we um, understood from the patients was not at fault to anybody working in the clinic, but rather the conditions of the clinic itself. 
for example, the um, patient overload that happens with the staff and the amount of appointments scheduled in the day, the lack of um, communication um, and availability. So the phone not being directly um, tied to the clinic, or you have to go through an operator multiple times to be able to even reach the clinic, if any, reach the clinic or like reach somebody that works at the clinic. And since it's only available two days a week, it's very difficult for people to have the opportunity to talk to someone or even view the clinic if they need like all of a sudden an emergency view change or if they need um, supplies that they're lacking. Um, they wanted more education, which um, is very important as well. But when you're rushed, like how the staff is rushed, it's very hard to provide that education um, without feeling that you're um, not being on time for your other patients. Um, and getting supplies, which was also mentioned that supplies from the clinic after you're discharged, you get supplies um, for like the dressings in your rooms, but they're shipped from a third party from the clinic to the patient's home, which can take, which we've heard, um, the patients don't receive those supplies on time and they may not have enough supplies to last them. They have to buy their own supplies or even make their own supplies, which can be very like stressful as a patient and also um, isn't the best on the clinic side because if it was at the hospital, then those supplies would be readily available to be given to the patient once they were discharged. Right, and so some, some of the insights that we took from this data um, from all the surveys and all of the um, observational data was that uh, direct communication between staff and patient is super important and that's kind of something that the clinic is lacking. So we kind of suggested creating a hotline or maybe giving that email to, um, to everybody instead of just those who ask so that they can get a hold of the clinic in a timely manner and also to communicate more medical education on discharge to follow up because some of these patients are expected to communicate their, um, their wound dressing instructions to a home health care. And that's really difficult because most of the time, patients only retain so much of what they've um, been taught in clinic, right? And then for the staff, um, direct communication among staff members is kind of something that's lacking. So we suggest having some kind of physical marker like the flags that you might see at um, some other clinics like on the outside of the door to um, allow the nurse to see where the doctor is and the doctor to see where the nurse is at so they can have their appointments in a more um, timely fashion. And for everyone to have access to supplies because something we also saw was that not everyone has um, like a key card to the supply closet. So you might need some kind of supply from a supply closet and you have to interrupt someone else's workflow um, to get that supply. Um, overall, we think making appointment slots larger and having more rooms and having more days available would really help avoid room clogging, um, staff stress, and um, help with the ability to have more time to communicate medical education. Um, and with that, moving the clinic to the hospital, having more time for the doctors to actually be in the clinic would also be helpful, and possibly creating a plan for the burn clinic the day before. And fun fact, they actually just um, are in the works to getting another day added because of this research. So are any questions are how will that research help improve the quality of the burn clinic that patients receive and actually overall help the staff as well? And will there ever be a time when the amount of money someone makes the insurance they have is not a factor in the healthcare recovery because the clinic is affected by the insurance that a patient has also is run by um, admin, which is the people that are in charge of the 10 minute slots. And how does health care or health insurance affect the clinic overall? So what is preventing? We've heard that there are issues with the health insurance that also affect the clinic and the conditions of the clinic. So we're wondering what like, what really is stopping the clinic from being its most, um, put, like giving highly its most potential. So some fringe benefits of our summer that are a little unrelated to our project. Um, we became masters at Excel this summer. Um, I can put in a lot of equations, very, very proud. Um, we also learned a lot about quality improvement. I wasn't aware of how much administration was involved in um, healthcare, right? And so we learned a lot of different resources and tools. We particularly um, used the PDSA cycle um, to plan this project. And we also got to shadow Dr. Casanion in the hospital. 
Um, so we were allowed to see um, different patients from the start of their journey as a burn patient in the hospital to sometimes seeing them in the outpatient clinic. Um, and this is Maya freaking out because she gets really anxious when we have to make phone calls. But yeah. Um, so I want to thank um, everyone who helped us this summer. Tanya Naten, who was the person that was in charge of our um, program, Dr. Kasanyan, who also gave us opportunity to shadow and gave us all the resources available. Haley and Brandy, who are the office workers who helped us very much with our staff and the phones and the rooms. Um, the clinic staff who let us interrupt or observe them in a stalkerish way, and overall CV staff for letting us have this um, opportunity. Great. Any comments, questions, or concerns? We have time for oh. one question. Mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead, ask your question. One question. So when you guys were, were like calling people and like serving them, did you like, how, how was that experience overall? Did you meet any like unpleasant people or people who were like woke up on the wrong side of the bed or anything like that? I will answer this question. So one time, um, yes, we have overall, yes. Um, some, for the most part, people are very vocal about their experiences. Everybody that was around the age of 50 to 60, because we did other statistics as well that we hope will aid in burn verification for oh, its own burn unit in the hospital because the hospitals don't have that. But that's another thing. Um, we asked other questions as well, and when we would ask them questions, like we mentioned, they would either be very confused or not know what's happening, so we would just have to cut the survey short and not use that data. Um, some people, I got yelled at one time because, <laughs> I got yelled at one time because of the questions that we asked, and um, some people think that we work for the clinic, but we had to explain that we're students, so they don't have the same attitude they have towards the clinic towards us because if they have a bad experience at the clinic and we're asking about their experience they are very they get very um emotional yeah. during their like question answering so some people are very nice about it they're like oh well, thank you so much i love the clinic and it's really nice and they'll give us a whole list about what they love and there's some people that are very vocal about what they dislike and they'll give us a whole list there's some that are there was one person that we called that was sleepy and then yeah. Okay. All right. Is Dr. Kasten on here? Um, I, don't I don't think, think so. so. We no, gave her no, a she's very busy. yesterday. Okay. Well, thank you very much, both of you. We're going to move on then to Lena Chow, uh, who's from Basic uh, Basis uh, Tucson North High School, and she worked with Dr. Clark Lance, who's Professor Emeritus. Lena, and make sure all of your video screens are on. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, that took a second. Um, uh, hi, my name is Lena Chow, and um, my pr uh, presentation is on early life exposure to biomass smoke, which leads to chronic pulmonary disease. So the initial questions that I had in the beginning of the summer were, uh, to what extent does biomass smoke change the structure and function of the lungs? What mechanisms does uh, biomass smoke induce chronic disease, and how can we use animal models to simulate population exposure? Sorry. So uh, biomass smoke is a product of combustion of biofuels, and it is produced from things like slash and burn farming, wildfires, and mainly cooking. Wildfires have become more frequent and destructive in changing climates, especially in areas prone to dryness like Tucson. Uh, the background picture of my first slide was during a fire from last summer, and it's the same with uh, the San Francisco fire right here. We can see that the uh, smoke in the pictures are extremely dense and being exposed to it at such a high concentration can lead to a lot of future health complications. Um, the image below is a NASA forecast of a smoke spreading across the U.S. from another uh, fire last summer. And 
when a wildfire occurs, it doesn't affect just the people on a local scale, but on a, a, a very far ranging scale. So particulate matter in wildfire poses uh, much more issues to respiratory health than fine particulate matter in other sources like factory smog or air pollution from vehicles. And approximately 3 billion people burn organic materials for cooking, heating, and lighting, which raises, um, which raises, oh, sorry, uh, which raises a lot of major health concerns worldwide since exposure to the smoke can increase respiratory infections, uh, cardiovascular disease, and chronic diseases like COPD and even cancer. Um, the most affected risk group for exposure to biomass smoke are mainly women and children, because traditionally um, women are cooking for their families, which gives them higher exposure time to the biomass smoke, especially in developing countries where they still use biofueled fires for cooking, like in the picture. And it's uh, especially dangerous for pregnant women as it could cause complications with their children later in their lives. Um, so for, uh, to model the, oh, oh my God, sorry, I'm so sorry. So we uh, simulated human exposure during pregnancy and children to expose biomass smoke using uh, mice models. And they were exposed to wood burning fires at uh, environmentally relevant concentrations by an in-house custom smoke inhalation system in the picture right here. So um, for the staining process that we used in our lab was called three-layer biotinylated horseradish peroxidase. And um, the steps to that staining are the lung tissues are first fixed with paraformaldehyde and then embedded into a paraffin wax and the slides are sectioned at five micrometers thick and then go into a deep paraffin wax and, rehyd and rehydrated. And then they get stained um, with three different primary antibodies that are specific to the protein and washed with distilled water in between every um, primary antibody used. The last, um, the last step is adding the substrate diaminobenzidine to produce a brown color precipitate, which stains the cell. And for immunofluorescence, the secondary antibody we use is conjugated with Alexa 488, which is a fluorophore that admits light at the length of 488 nanometers. We also use immunohistochemistry to determine biomarkers by using image analysis uh, by airway morphometry, we can measure the expression level by selecting the area of interest to exclusively analyze the stained area in epithelial cells. So uh, hematosin and eosin stains are most commonly used for pathology to determine disease states. Uh, and biomass smoke activates the innate immunity as like in asthma and COPD. And here on the control type cell, we can see that the red um, that there are only red blood vessel or red red blood cells in the blood vessels, but in the biomass smoke uh, treated cells, we can see that there are dark spots inside the blood vessels. Those are white blood cells, and the nucleus in the blood cells are stained um, dark. So there's a contrast between the two, and. That shows a high state of inflammation in, within the cell or within the blood vessels. And under a high magnification lens, we can see um, the macrophage and inosinophils inside the white blood vessels. And the way I didn't, uh, I couldn't find a picture for it, but um, the white blood cells have multiple nucleuses that form a U shape and they're, uh, take, they take up most of the cell inside the white blood cell. So next are mucins, which are a major component to mucus. Um, in the airways, the mucin MUC5AC 
is found to be highly expressed in asthmatic and COPD patients, and uh, also patients with allergies. Mucin buildup triggers people to cough more in order to expel the contaminants within the airways. And here you can see uh, a major increase in expression on the uh, biomass smoke treated cells. Uh, most of the epithelial cells in the airway are irregularly shaped, and they're also uh, highly inflamed compared to the control, which are um, fairly uniform, and they show a relatively low uh, protein expression. So CC16 is an anti-inflammatory biomarker that shows uh, normally high expression in healthy epithelial cells. And a decrease in this expression can be used as a biomarker to indicate uh, lung disease states. Patients with these uh, pulmonary injuries show significant low levels of CC16. As you can see from the picture on the right, it's a lot dimmer than in the control group. Uh, so for Pico Series Red, it's a staining method that shows uh, that selectively highlights collagen, and we use a polarized lens to show only the collagen um, in the picture. And the way the polarized lens works is that it blocks certain angles of light to only allow uh, light that is parallel to the polarized lens into uh, the picture. And the intensity of the intensity of the light and also the fiber thickness around the airways in the control is a lot lower than how it looks in the biomass exposed uh, cells. The intensity here is a lot stronger and the airways, you can see there's a thicker lining around the airways and uh, that indicates a chronic condition called fibrosis that is only apparent in the biomass treated cell. So in summary, Early life exposure to biomass smoke does lead to a lot of health uh, risks higher in life. Uh, increased morality from chronic disease occurring at a younger age, altered phenotypes that lead to the hallmarks of COPD, such as smooth muscle and collagen buildup or chronic inflammation. And it also leads to an increased risk of infections. The remaining questions that I have for this uh, project are how can we recover the damage brought onto epithelial cells from biomass smoke exposure? Um, what type of preventative measures can we take to reduce the effects of uh, chronic exposure? And what biomarkers can we target to reduce the effects of biomass smoke? And finally, I would like to acknowledge and thank the SEMI program for curating this program and allowing me to work with Dr. Clark Lance and also Doug Cromie, who uh, helped me take all the pictures for from the microscopes. And uh, yeah, that's it. Any questions? How about one question? Uh, I have a question. Um, could you please uh, explain what were some of the uh, observed phenotypes um, after the progression of the disease? Wait, can you repeat that again? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, could you please explain some of the observed phenotypes of the, um, like once the disease was developed? Wait, I'm, uh... What are the clinical manifestations are you asking, Natalia? When you say the phenotype, or are you referring to the tissues? I'm referring to the tissues or the clinical, uh, whichever is easier to answer. Um. There's, well, um, the biomass smoke induces goblet cell hyperplasia from the, um, in muse, wait, sorry, uh, I need to, <coughs> So um, the biomass smoke induces a lot of um, airway remodeling. Like with the Pico Series Red, uh, there was a lot of fibrosis concentration in the uh, biomass treated cells. And also for the, 
the cells with the uh, mucin expression, you can see that there's a higher uh, there's a higher concentration of those types of expressions within the biomass treated cells. Okay. All right. Is Dr. Lance here? Uh, no, he couldn't make it. Okay. If not, we're going to go on. Thank you, Lena. We're going to go on to Jared Fisher. Uh, he's currently an undergraduate at the University of Arizona. He was formerly uh, a, uh, a high school student, I think from Rio Rico, if I remember correctly. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Jared. Uh, and he worked with uh, Rajas Khanna, uh, in, who's a professor in the pharmacology department. Sorry about that. I was trying to unmute. Um, yeah, I'm from here. Originally went to Rio Rico High School, so you're correct with that. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yes. All right. Uh -huh. Awesome. Okay. So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jared Fisher. I am a sophomore at the University of Arizona, studying biochemistry. Um, so this summer, I had the privilege to return to the Kana Lab. Um, I worked under Dr. Rajesh Kana and Dr. Oban Matal. And in the Kana lab, we are trying to answer um, the question, how can we regulate chronic pain? And so there's like a million different facets of chronic pain that, you know, our lab deals with. And I've decided to kind of look at this complex um, condition known as perineoplastic syndrome, which I'll get into more uh, later on. But essentially, my project revolved around characterizing autoimmune from five neuropathy. Um, so uh, to start off, I'd like to go over some of the beginning questions I had. Um, here, let me move this. Okay. Um, so, oops. Okay. How are CRIMP5, autoimmune CRIMP5 neuropathy and chronic pain related? What does the physiological process of gaining CRIMP5 autoimmunity look like? And how do perineoplastic syndromes present themselves? Um, so before I go in depth on my actual project, I'd like to discuss what my lab was doing. Um, so with chronic pain, um, pain on, on the right are, is a diagram basically explaining um, the pain signal. Um, pain signals can be broken down into three parts, um, where it says one um, right here is where the body initially picks up on stimuli, such as pressure, heat, cold, or basically anything um, that the body is reactive to, and it can travel from there along a nerve pathway um, following uh, the activation of action potentials. And uh, the action potentials are a pretty complicated uh, process. It's basically an activation of ion channels um, between neurons, but essentially it moves along uh, this neuronal pathway all the way to the spinal cord where uh, the pain signal is then uh, sent to the brain uh, for the body to realize that it's experiencing pain. So with chronic pain, um, this pain signal can be persistent. And um, in fact, it can persist for months or even years after initial injury or illness. And our current approach are highly addictive opioids, which I'm sure we are all pretty familiar with the opioid crisis. Um, our lab's approach right now to kind of circumvent feeling um, the opioid crisis is developing non-opioid regulators of chronic pain. And we're doing this by studying um, the crimp protein family and ion channels along the neuronal pathway. Um, so CRIMP stands for collapse and response mediator protein. And there are five known subtypes of this protein. And uh, in my previous summer through SIMI as a high school student, I focused mostly on CRIMP2, the second subtype. This summer I uh, kind of switched pathways and started focusing on CRIMP5. So this all came to be once uh, Dr. Doobie through the Mayo Clinic released this uh, publication and it kind of sparked interest with uh, my mentor and I, where uh, Dr. Doobie focused on a condition known as perineoplastic syndrome. And with perineoplastic syndrome, um, perineoplastic means along the side of cancer. Um, it's a condition that uh, is related to autoimmunity against uh, the fifth subtype of the collapse and response mediator protein family. And basically, uh, this condition is characterized by multiple cranial neuropathies. Um, 
And what's interesting about it is that 79% of patients with CRIMP5 autoimmune uh, autoimmunity experience some form of pain, um, usually associated with uh, neuropathies. And eventually these pain states can become chronic. Uh, so this, these are uh, you know, some data that my mentor uh, collected earlier in the year. Uh, he decided to look at the pain phenotype of CRIMP5 autoimmunity in rats. And so essentially what he did was he immunized um, with the plasmid um, expressing CRIM5. Um, he immunized a rat model um, with three intramuscular injections, each two weeks apart, and compared it to a control, that which was an empty plasmid. And as you can see in panel I in the top right corner, um, there was basically a rise of anti crimp 5 autoantibodies over time um, with each injection. Um, so some of the data we're interested in here is panels A, B, and E and F. Um, a and B are the male and E and F are the female, but basically in both male and female rats, uh, they both developed allodynia. And allodynia is a condition where um, you experience pain from signals that you really shouldn't experience pain from. And in this case, it was hypersensitivity to a light touch on the paw. So basically we're trying to figure out how can we ca characterize the epitopes of CRIMP5 targeted by autoantibodies and a model of autoimmune CRIMP5 neuropathy. And that's kind of a mouthful, but essentially um, we're, we're trying to analyze the specific peptides associated with epitopes of CRIMP5. And epitopes are basically the uh, binding uh, site located on the CRIMP5 protein that would bond to an autoantibody um, against CRIMP5. So uh, in order to do this, I started a set of experiments with peptide, peptide arrays. So I would print peptides of CRIMP5 um, onto slides following a known pattern so I can go back and analyze it um, to see which peptide was specifically related to the epitope. And then I treated with the serum, as you can see in the top left, um, that pink media is like a serum that contains auto, auto antibodies of CRIMP5. And um, those were collected from rat models. And then I treated it with a set of secondary antibodies um, and then imaged with fluorescence. So this was uh, in the bottom, bottom left, there's an image of a uh, black and white version of the fluorescence I imaged. And the amount of fluorescence indicates the binding interactions of on the peptides. So I'd like to kind of discuss the progress I made while answering my beginning questions. One was I developed a more understand, like complex understanding of the complexity and subjectivity of pain. Um, you know, pain is universal, but I each, each patient experiences pain in a different way, which I think is fascinating. Um, I also developed proficiency in basic and some advanced laboratory technique. Um, I began conducting experiments independently. Um, and because of this, I got to address some personal questions and in addition to my uh, lab's questions. And I began to question the effic efficiency of lab technique as I um, started doing some experiments. So um, before I end with um, some of my uh, ending questions. I'd like to go over some fringe benefits. One was time management. Um, I think that's a skill we've all kind of improved on over the summer with working in a lab. Um, and then also problem, problem solving skills. I mean, every day is, as a scientist, you kind of have a new problem you have to address. And then um, I also gained a more complex understanding of ignorance as an undergrad. Um, and I'm really appreciative of that. Okay, uh, so some remaining questions I have are, which CRIMP5 peptides display higher fluorescence indicating epitopes of autoantibody auto targeting? Um, I haven't gotten to uh, analysis of the fluorescence yet, so this I should of course be answered uh, through that. One, another question is, is autoantibody targeting uh, dependent on demographics such as uh, sex and age? Um, those are factors that I think you need to consider when you're starting experiments. And then uh, does genetic immunization via plasmids in a rat model for CRIMP5 autoimmunity translate well into a human model of uh, perineoplastic syndrome where, you know, uh, CRIMP5 autoimmunity occurs naturally? 
Um, I plan to answer these questions. I mean, I have two weeks left as an undergrad, so hope, um, hopefully I can uh, answer some of those questions in the remainder of the SEMI program, but I hope to return back to the lab um, as a lab volunteer in the, the fall to finish my project. Um, I'll perform analysis on the data I collected. Um, and then I also want to test whether or not a rat model's sex or age has a significant effect on peptide array fluorescence. Um, and then besides that, I want to study previous models of genetic immunization using DNA. Specifically, I want to compare genetic immunization using mRNA and the COVID-19 vaccination, which I think that's a pretty interesting insight. Uh, you know, even though it's a horrible situation we're living through, it's provided so much um, interesting insights into the you know, research that we're doing right now. Um, so that's it for my presentation. Does anyone have any questions? Um, I have one. How do you plan to, um, the last question that you had about the immunization with the mRNA and the COVID-19 vaccine, how do you plan on answering that? Yeah, so um, my mentor earlier in the pandemic, he actually began exploring um, the spike protein um, of the COVID uh, particle. And he found that the spike protein can actually um, inhibit a pain signal um, by blocking a, re a receptor, which is, you know, it's kind of groundbreaking research. Um, and I'm not too comfortable on it, but I definitely want to look more into that research and see how um, uh, both that and, you know, that new mRNA technology, how they use genetic immunization using that. How could I apply that to a rat model as well um, when I'm uh, altering, uh, you know, the genetic immunization of, against CRIMP5 uh, when creating an animal model? Okay. Is uh, Dr. Kana here? Uh, he is not here today. Okay. All right, thank you very much, Jared. Uh, our next, yeah, thank you. Our next presenter is Alani Martinez, and she's from Copa High School in Yuma, and she worked with uh, MACAN, their team. And she's an associate professor, I think, of pharmacology. And is May here? Is my Canna? Um, I don't think she's here, but my mentor is. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so hi, my name is Alani Martinez. Um, this summer I spent shadowing Dr. Jonathan Sanchez at the Micana lab, and our focus was on necroptosis inhibition. Um, so my initial questions were, what is necroptosis? How are we able to inhibit and induce necroptosis? What is the pathway that leads to? What kind of lab technique is available to use when trying to lab image anything related to necroptosis and what are the therapeutics related or created? So um, necroptosis is a regulated cell death pathway that contrasts apoptosis. The difference is that necroptosis is pro-inflammatory and apoptosis generates a less inflammatory response. Right here are the damp molecules, which are damaged um, associated molecular patterns that are released when stress cells are undergoing necros necrosis and act as danger signals to promote and activate the inflammatory response. <laughs> so it is important to study necroptosis because of the diseases related. Um, it is a cellular response to environmental stress that can be caused by chemical and mechanical injury, inflammation, or infection. Um, it has been implicated in pathogenesis, multiple disorders such as Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and multiple sclerosis. It also plays a role in pathogenesis of various diseases across the body like neurological, infectious, and autoimmune. And the relationship between inflammation and necroptosis is thought to be the central component of pathogenesis of necroptosis-associated diseases, and it is initiated by a certain pathway. So right here, we have the three different outcomes, um, including cell survival, apoptosis, and which our focus is necroptosis. So upon activation, there are two other pathways available. The pathway starts with the TNFA alpha, um, which is a protein that binds with a receptor, which is TNFR1. 
So then RIPK1 then binds along, which will then lead to cell survival right here. And then if there is a RIPK1 deubiquitation, it'll then cause the cell to go undergo apoptosis. So after here, the caspase 8 is important in apoptosis. And if inactivated, then the process now transfers over to necroptosis over here. And then here is where RIPK1 binds with RIPK3, and then it phosphorylates, and RIPK3 binds with RIPK3, and they phosphorylate together. So then here, the LK all then goes to the membrane and causes necroptosis. So this is our focus, the pathway. In my lab experience, in it, to initiate necroptosis, we added the TNF alpha, then added a drug that inhibits CAP1 and 2. And then we added ZVAD against caspase 8. Several inhibitors have been developed for this protein. And NEC1 and its derivatives target RIPK1. The GS case here, they target RIPK3 and inhibit enzyme activity. So the compound that we use is compound 9, and it only affects the MLKL phosphorylation levels by interacting with RIPK3 and preventing MLKL from binding. Um, our goal is to inhibit necroptosis. The inhibitors have been developed to all, or all the inhibitors, or most of them have been developed, all bind in the ATP pocket and are all type 1, 2, and 3 which all inhibit ATP from binding. So most of the kinase inhibitors do compete with ATP and all of the necroptosin inhibitors so far have been failed clinical trials and can be seen as toxic with humans. So in this first figure, the red hexagon represents the inhibitor. Meanwhile, the blue shape is the protein kinase. There are different types of approaches that are used to interact the ATP with the protein. The approach that we use, however, is um, type 4. So we do not interfere with ATP like the rest of the other three types. And type 4 inhibitors are extremely rare and sought after. Our approach is different since it prevents the protein binding. And our drug, our drug is protein, I'm sorry. Our drug is compound 9, which we use that binds with K3 and replaces MLKL. So with targeting a different site, we prevent RIPK3 and MLKL from binding, which creates less phosphorylation and leads to ne less necroptosis. So in my rotation, I focus on characterizing our compounds and the effect of RIPK1, RIPK3, and MLKL levels. We all did this by using a Western blot. We use Western blots to be able to detect any denatured proteins. We also use this to be able to identify a particular protein from a mixture of proteins. So a Western dot blot does this by separating a specific protein from a complex, by separating by size, transfer of protein to a solid support, and by marking target proteins using a primary and secondary antibody to visualize. A primary protein is soaked to recognize and bind to a specific target protein. The membrane is soaked in this antibody before a secondary antibody is added to bind to the first. The secondary antibody can then be visualized through radioactivity, staining, or immunofluorescence, which then um, allows detection of particular proteins. So here are my results of my Western blots. We used three different um, samples. We used a non-treated DMSO, and then we used our compound nine for each of being RIPK1, RIPK3, and MLKL. The DMSO was used to dissolve the compound nine and was used to differ, differ, oh, sorry, to tell the difference of what is the actual compound and what is just DMSO. The green line shown right here in RIPK3 and MLKL are the internal standard, which was beta actin. And it is just a protein in cells that serves as the internal standard to tell the differences and is known as um, the housekeeping gene. Here are the results of my quantified Western blots that were normalized to beta actin. We ran a statistical analysis to analyze where there was a significant difference. 
Um, so here are my RIPK1, RIPK3, MLKL, and the three samples, each being non-treated DMSO and the compound nine. Um, although RIPK1, the DMSO sample does look different, all the samples when compared had a higher value than zero point, had a higher p-value than 0 0.05, which in, in the end, it was telling no significant difference. Um, similarly, we saw the similar results between um, RIPK3 and MLKL. The graphs then showed that RIPK1, RIPK3, and MLKL intensities normalized to beta actin. And we all wanted, we wanted all the protein amounts to stay the same. So there is no difference in our RIPK1, our RIPK3, and MLKL samples as we decrease the levels of MLKL phosphorylation proved in recent studies does not affect the amount of protein. So final questions that I had was, what differences would be made of instead of trying to prevent binding in MLK, um, sorry, of binding in RIPK3 and MLKL, binding prevention was made in RIPK1 and RIPK3. If RIPK1 and MLKL were raised to bind, were instead to bind, what outcome would occur? What would be the difference in results if a different visualization form of Western blots was used? And how could our results have changed if we used a different set of samples? Thank you, Alani. If we have one quick question, one quick one. Uh, if not, uh, we'll go on to the next presenter. Oh, is there one? Yes, go ahead. You had one quick question. Oh, or or you have your your mentor wants to make a comment, brief comment. Okay, if if not, we're going to go on to Annette Garcia. Uh, who's from the University of Arizona, and her mentor is Dr. Melissa Helpern, who's Associate Professor in Pediatrics. Let's keep to the time. We're running a little behind again, but we do have a break coming up. Is Annette getting ready there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I am. Could you help Juan if there's some difficulty? Um, can you guys see my screen now? It's loading. It did show your presentation. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, so good morning. My name is Anna Garcia, and I'm going to be talking about my SEMI experience this 2021. So this summer, I got the privilege to work at Dr. Halpern's lab for the second consecutive year. Um, I did it once while I was a junior in high school, and I did it last year as well. Um, so my mentors were Dr. Melissa Halpern and Dr. Christine Calton, and the focus in our lab is necrotizing enterocolitis. So some background on necrotizing enterocolitis, um, neck for short. So what neck is, it's the most common intestinal disease of premature infants. So it's a hemorrhagic inflammatory necrosis of the distal ilium. So to um, explain that a little further, it's when um, premature babies um, are fed like formula and not fed like breast milk, it's very likely for them to develop this disease. And it causes inflammation in the tissue, which can then cause necrosis and it can turn out to be very severe. 
um, the exact cause is still unknown. And like I mentioned before, some of the major risk factors are um, prematurity, internal feeding, or bacterial colonization. So the main question in the lab is what role do bile acids play in the development of NEC? Um, which brings me to my, my first questions in the lab, which were, um, what were the results of the research that we did last summer? Because um, I didn't get any of the results back um, after the program ended. So I wanted to know how the results, what the results were for the previous rat studies. And so I was able to read more about the results. And previously we had the hypothesized that neonatal pups treated with bacteria species capable of converting primary bile acids to secondary bile acids would increase um, susceptibility to NIC. Um, so the way we did this was we delivered neonatal rats via C-section, and then they were subjected to hypoxia and cold stress twice daily to induce NIC in them. So then these pups were hand-fed formula. Um, using like a tube that was put down the esophagus straight into the stomach. And that's where we fed the formula. We had four different groups, which were the PBS, which was the control group of just neck. Then a group was given C. syndens bacteria and another group difficile, and we had um, damp bed pups. So here we can see um, the tissue the tissue of the different groups. And we can see how the damp bed um, has definitely a, a more healthier looking tissue in comparison to the ascendance. Um, and the results were that um, the C ascendance and has both severity and incidence of neck and neonatal rat models. And C difficile, which is unable to convert bile acids um, did not increase NIC. So the findings suggest that overgrowth of bile acid converting bacteria could contribute to NIC pathology. And here we can see the percentage of NIC of each group, ascendants having the greatest percentage and damp beds didn't have any NIC at all. So my work in the lab this summer was more engineering related. So I worked on a feeding device that would facilitate um, hand feeding prenatal mice. So the thing about prenatal mice is that they're way smaller than um, the rat models that we're currently using. So it's very hard to hand feed them in the way that I previously mentioned. So previously last year, um, a biomedical engineering master's student, Jennifer, um, worked on developing a mouse nipple that, that was like a mouse nipple shaped device that molds around a syringe and helps um, hand feed. So here is a picture of her work. She started by 3D printing these like um, mouse nipples, but um, she found that this was the best design, which was um, made by 3D printing a mold that then would allow us to pour a gel, a medical gel, that then hardened around the, the syringe. And this allowed us to feed um, the mice. So this was her previous mold design. Um, there was some issues with it worked fine, but there was some issues with it, such as that one side was slightly larger than the other. Um, it's not very noticeable in the picture and it was just by a few like millimeters, but this caused a big difference because um, the mice had trouble latching on. Another issue with this was that it had a spherical bottom, which made it really hard to stand. And since we had to pour the gel and wait, it, wait for it to solidify, we had to use like a rack, which is very like inefficient. Um, it also was very hard to place the syringe like upright. We kind of had to use tape to make it hold right in the middle. And it didn't always, it didn't always like stand right where we needed it to. Also, there was a ridge here on the side that allowed it to stay together, but it was hard to take apart. We had to like pry it open and a lot of the molds were breaking. So I was asked to make some design improvements to the mold. So one of my first um, 
one of the first improvements was to make both sides um, symmetrical. That way we had an even um, shape for the mouse nipple. Um, I also decided to add a funnel at the top so that it was easier to pour. To pour. We work with a gel that has to be heated to a very high temperature so that it becomes liquid and this makes it, prevents us from burning our fingers. Um, I also added a small incision here at the bottom. It's kind of hard to see, but the purpose was so that we know where to exactly place the needle for the syringe. Um, I also decided to just keep like parallel ridges at the side so that it wouldn't be hard to pry them open. And I thought it'd be a better idea just to use a clamp to hold them together. And this way um, the molds wouldn't break. Um, we 3D printed this and we sanded them down to have a cleaner result. Um, so this is what the new feeding device looks like after it was printed and made. Um, this was one of the first um, feeding nipples that was made with the new molds. Um, obviously there's some improvements that could be made just like anything in engineering. Um, there's always room for improvement and some of the improvements are, I would make the incision for the size of the incision for the needle a little smaller just so that it can have a better grip and the material used for the mold is black and it's very um, it's very not porous at all. So it really slides a lot. So maybe going back to a clear material and a more porous material would be beneficial. Um, aside from working on this project, I was able to help with some of the animal studies in this lab. One of the first studies was to find what the best wrap ups for the next study would be from Charles River or Tick Onik. Um, we wanted to see which pups developed um, neck better. So we saw that the tectonic pups were larger in size and the Charles River pups were way smaller and a lot of them um, did not survive, but they did develop neck better. So we decided to use those for the next study. So this study took place in July 6, from July 6 to July 10th. And it's very similar to the study that I mentioned previously. It's pretty much the same. So we delivered the rats via C-section. Um, we hand fed the rats every four hours. So we took turns in the lab going in at 6 a.m., 10 a.m., 2 p.m., 6 p.m., and then 10 p.m. We had the same groups, the PBS neck, C. Sinden, C. difficile, and Damphen. Um, finally, we connect, collected ilium on July 10th, but we still haven't gotten the results back from this study. We will in the upcoming weeks, but we can predict that it's gonna be very similar to the results that I mentioned previously. Um, I worked on some other technical work, such as Western blots on ilium from previous studies. Um, we stain for Claudin 2, Claudin 3, and Claudin 4, which are all tight junction proteins. I still haven't received these yet. I am still going to be working in the lab for two more weeks. Um, and lastly, this last week, I worked on pulsatile bile acid treatments. So we were trying to determine whether exposing BBE cells to pulsatile bile acid treatments at a higher concentration alter the expression of Claudin-2 protein. So the way this worked was um, I, every 30 minutes for six hours, added CDCA media, which is the bile acid medium, and media to some of the wells. So some of the wells had higher concentrations of bile acids and some had no bile acids at all. And after that, I lysed the, cell, the cells and performed the BCA assay. Um, and calculated the protein in each of the samples. I did this just last week, so we haven't done um, the gel electrophoresis or the Western blood, so I still don't have the results for that, which brings me to the final questions, which are, um, what, would, what would the results be for this study and how would higher concentrations of bile acids um, affect the concentration, the expression of clotted two protein? Um, some of my final questions in regards to my mold would be um, what would be the best material to use in order to have a more efficient mold that holds together better. 
Um, I also would like to know if bile, if we know that secondary bile acids um, really affect the increase the possibility of developing neck, knowing this information, how could we prevent neck and stop the overgrowth of these secondary bile acids? And that's it. I open the floor to any questions. We have time for one very quick question. A very quick question. Uh, if not, uh, Annette, when you uh, would you add one slide to your PowerPoint that is the questions, so your final questions? So just add it, add another slide so that that'll be part of your PowerPoint. Sure. Okay. So do that if you can in the next uh, by tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Uh, so if we don't have any questions, is Dr. Helpern here? No, she's not. Uh, if not, uh, we'll go on. We're a little behind here, and I don't want us to get too much more behind. So try to keep to your time, folks. Um, our next presenter is Danielle uh, Hermosillo, and she's from Choi High School. And uh, she worked in the Gashan lab with Dr. Zhu, who's um, an associate professor of pediatrics. Can you hear me? Can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can hear right, you and you. see your screen. Thank you. Oh, let me start okay. Um, hi, my name is Danielle Murcio. I'm currently a senior at Choya High School. Uh, my mentors at my lab was Dr. Hua and Gladio. And today I'll be talking about the genotyping technique and the importance it plays in identifying NHGH. Now, um, I began with some questions. Um, what, like some of my questions, my beginning questions were, what is PCR? And um, what's the importance of genotyping? And um, what, wh why is the mucus layer very important for your colon? And many other um, questions. Uh, what my lab mainly focuses on uh, is the role of NHH in the mucin production. Uh, they also focus on if NHH is directly involved in this production of mucin, and if so, what are the pathways it, it takes to reach the process? And there's a, in your left, there's a picture, and this is just a demonstration. It's not actually the pathways that NHH takes, but it's just to demonstrate how complicated uh, the pathways could be. So that's what my lab is like trying to find. Uh, okay, so as I mentioned before, I'll be mainly talking about genotyping. And so uh, we first start with um, cutting tails and like, the breeders. You can see we collected tissue. This would be, this is like a very important step for genotyping. Um, next, we prepare a buffer called lysis buffer. Um, this will dissolve our, our tissue samples. And we will also use a water bath to help with this process. And this is gonna be left overnight. Next, we, after this is like the next day, uh, we take it to the culture hood and we prepare a mix with uh, buffer primers and water and we distribute to each sample. As you can see, this is how much we added during our experiment. Uh, next, we take it back and we put them in tinier tubes to fit into a machine called thermocycler or PCR machine that stands for polymerase chain reaction. Uh, what this machine mainly does, it increases and decreases the temperature to make millions of copies of the DNA. And it does that by three steps. Uh, first would be denaturing the, the DNA at 96 degrees Celsius. Next would be annihilating, which cools down the reaction to like 65 degrees Celsius to allow the primers to come in. And these primers will like tell the DNA polymerase where to start, which is our next step, extension. And these DNA polymerase will like start making new strands of DNA. Uh, and this will, this will run for one hour in bowel that's uh, running, we prepare gel or 
uh, called agros gel and we use agros powder. Then we add 25 millimeters of TAE solution and we put it into a microwave for like one minute. Um, next, we add ethidium bromine. This will allow our samples or bands to illuminate when it's exposed to UV light. And this is just like a little demonstration of what's gonna happen. Uh, then after that, we add it to our mold and we wait until it's solid. It's solid. Then we add it to a container where we add more TAE solution. And as you can see, there's the gel in there. We add our samples using a pipette. Be careful, you don't want to spill it. Um, next, we run it through a voltage, up, like a machine that would use voltage. We would add 120 and we would run it for 10 minutes. And as you can see in the middle picture, it's already like starting to run. Uh, our samples are like slightly negative charge. So it's gonna run to a positive charge because they're, attract they're attracted to the positive. And after the 10 minutes, we put it into a machine called a G-Box. And this is where the ethidium ethi bromine comes in. Uh, the machine will expose our, our gel with um, UV light. So this is where it comes in. Uh, now we have our results. These, the one on your left is our results from this experiment. Uh, as you can see, we have a bunch of white type, I mean wild type, sorry, and heterogeneous. Those are main, mainly used for breeding. And on our right samples, uh, these are uh, knockouts. But the reason I put these two is because if you can see here, uh, this bolded one, this is our negative control and it's very bold. So that meant that it's contaminated. So we want to check for contamination. And then our sample, uh, sorry, our results in the left in our negative control, there was none. So it was perfect. Now in this case, wild type will mean that the mice um, has the genetic mark of NHEH that we're looking for and knockouts uh, in this case will also mean that they, they did not have the gene, gene mark that we were looking for. Um, but what uh, what's the importance of NHEH? Uh, well, it's been linked to uh, the production of this mucin, which makes mucus, like this mucus barrier. And this will be our first line like of defense in our colon. Um, oh, yeah. It's also called a mucosal protection. And if you can see here, it's like a barrier. And as I mentioned before, it's like our first line of defense from bacteria and very bad stuff from entering your epithelial. Um, so if bacteria does come in, this could be very damaging for your epithelial cells and your, your just if, in general, your epithelial layer. Um, and this can confuse the cells that are in there. If bacteria does come in, these cells will panic and call other cells for backup. And those cells will panic and call other cells for backup. And this can lead to uh, inflammatory bowel disease, or um, it could also lead to ulcerative colitis. Now, what makes this mucin? Goblet cells. Goblet cells are a type of epithelial cell that synthesizes and secretes mucin in these large air ways right here, if you can see. Um, so if bacteria gets into our epithelial air, it destroys these cells. And if these cells are destroyed, there's nothing to make mucin to protect you from that bacteria. So it's like just a lose-lose thing. -lose. So that's what my lab is like trying to find. Like how can we link NHEH and prevent that from happening? And how can NHEH help us produce more of this mucin? And my questions remaining were, what can happen if bacteria gets into a deeper part of your epithelia, um, like your lamina propria? And 
just more deeper. Um, and does the decrease of mucin affect the way the intestine digests and absorbs? Like, does the increase of mucin affect the way the intestine should work? And that's it. Any questions? Okay. Do we have one quick question from anyone? If not, thank you very much, Danielle. These have been excellent presentations. I mean, remarkable. So let's continue to go. And we have um, uh, twins coming up here who worked uh, with um, Wei Zhou, Dr. Zhou, who's a professor and head of vascular surgery. And um, we're going to start with uh, Faviana Tobar Blanchard who's from La, La Joya Community High School, and also Natalia Padilla, who's from the University of California in Berkeley. Thank you. So they're gonna to present together and try to keep to your time. Um, hello, my name is Natalia Padilla. As Dr. Woody mentioned, I'm a second year student at UC Berkeley. Hello, I'm Tobar Blanchard, and I am an incoming freshman at NAU. We worked under the mentorship of Dr. Zhao, the Chief of Vascular Surgery in the Department of Surgery at the University of Arizona. She specializes in the study of cardiovascular disease with a focus on atherosclerosis. Moreover, this summer, we specifically studied resistant expression in relation to atherosclerosis. Our initial question um, was, what is atherosclerosis? Atherosclerosis is a disease that begins with hyperlipidemia that progresses to fatty streaks and lesions in the arteries, as well as leading to the accumulation of endothelial cells, lipids, low density lipoproteins and other substances in the arteries. Over time, that fat deposit calcifies into atherosclerotic plaque, narrowing the arteries and blocking blood flow from reaching important organs and tissues. If untreated, that plague runs the risk of rupturing which causes cholesterol and other substances to spill into the bloodstream, ultimately creating a thrombus or a blood clot. The danger of atherosclerosis relies on the fact that not only are the symptoms very interchangeable with other conditions, but also that atherosclerotic plaque can develop into any artery. As such, the progression of atherosclerosis may lead to heart attacks, uh, kidney disease, vision loss, strokes, and even lead to the development of dementia. Furthermore, our following question was, what are the risk factors associated with atherosclerosis, which mainly include high cholesterol, high blood pressure, physical inactivity, obesity, and diabetes, particularly type 2. Additionally, throughout the lab experience, we learned about the significance of obesity and type 2 diabetes, which brings us to our next question, how does obesity impact the development of type 2 diabetes? Thus, obesity is the result of excess nutrients that becomes too much for the endoplasmic reticulum to handle, which ultimately impacts the insulin receptors within the cell, later developing um, resistant, resistant or insulin resistance to high glucose levels, also leading to the progression of type 2 diabetes in which the cell stops responding to the produced insulin. So what is resistant exactly? Well, resistant is an adipokine that is resistant to insulin. Its presence has been found in multiple conditions and processes that lead to the development of cardiovascular disease, including inflammation, endothelial dysfunction, thrombosis, androgenesis, and smooth muscle cell dysfunction. So what does it have to do with atherosclerosis? Well, one of the things that all atherosclerotic patients have in common, regardless of whether they are asymptomatic, symptomatic, diabetic, or obese, is that all of them express uh, high resistant levels um, in their blood. Furthermore, the focus of our lab this summer was to observe the manipulation of resistant expression via mice models in relation to the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis. Thus, to manipulate resistant expression in our lab, we use LPS or lipopolysaccharide, an irritative stimuli that mediates inflammation of the arteries via macrophages activated by the toll like receptor 4 or TLR4. Furthermore, the inclusion of LPS was meant to serve as our independent variable, 
as it may manipulate resistant expression in our experimental models. Through that model, we could formulate our main experimental question to truly observe how LPS affects resistant uh, acceleration secreted by macrophages and how humanized mice models uh, help us observe that. With this experiment, we would be able to enforce that resistance is produced at the macrophages and observe its expression after the addition of LPS. We chose three different models to observe the different levels of resistance. These models included uh, the macrophages from knockout and transgenic mice, as well as THP1 cells. And um, in humans, the resistant gene is found in chromosome 19 and is produced via macrophages. Whereas in mice, the resistant gene is found in chromosome A and is produced in the adipocytes or fat cells. Thus, in our model, we use the knockout mouse that lacks the resistant producing gene, as well as the transgenic mice that produces human resistant via macrophages through genetic modification. Our third model were uh, THP1 cells, which are monocytic leukemic cells that serve as a model for human monocytes. Um, just a quick uh, warning for the uh, next slide. We do feature a picture with relatively graphic content. So. Um, furthermore, to begin our experimental, our pre-experimental process, we gathered blood from the left ventricle of both our knockout and transgenic mice. In addition, we also used PBS or phosphate buffered saline to dilute the blood. After collecting the blood sample from our knockout and transgenic mice, we added fecal pad to initiate a separation to later be placed in the centrifuge machine with no breaks for 30 minutes in order to gather the PBMCs or rather the peripheral blood mononuclear cells from the white blood cell portion. We could then observe the distinction of the blood composition. Blood is composed of both liquid and solid components. The liquid portion encompasses serum and plasma, whereas the solid is made of platelets, red blood cells and white blood cells. In the picture displayed, you can see um, that the plasma, the white blood cells, and red blood cells have separated into layers. After separation, we discarded the plasma and then collected the PBMCs from the white blood cell portion of the centrifuge tube. However, for our THP1 samples, we, de we developed them using cell, cu cell culture by using our PMI medium with 10% FBS or fetal bovine serum as well as place them in an incubator at 37 degrees Celsius with a 5% level of carbon dioxide. In addition, our THP1 cell culture began as monocytes, similar to the PBMCs gathered from the mice samples that were gonna be later converted into macrophages. Upon collecting the mice samples and developing the THP1 cell cultures, we needed to convert the PBMCs and monocytes into macrophages, which was done by adding PMA slash TPA to our samples. Um, PMA slash TPA is often used to stimulate the differentiation of cells. In our case, in the case of our experiment, PBMC slash monocytes differentiated into macrophages to later secrete resistant expression. Um, these are the comparison pictures of the first and second day for the knockout sample. Um, as you can see, the first, uh, the first day cells are very round and circular. But by the second day, the cells um, elongated, which showed that they were converting from monocytes into macrophages. This is um, the pictures from our transgenic mice. Um, an issue we, we ran into in the lab was how our first transgenic mice sample became contaminated. So we had to regather the blood and repeat the same process. So this is labeled our transgenic one sample in which day one of adding um, TPA slash PMA, um, you can see the cells from day one and our day two observations, which include that the cells began to clump together and change in shape, which meant that they were ready to have LPS added to induce resistance. And the, this is our THP1 um, cells from day one of adding um, TPA slash PMA and our day two observations, which were similar to the last in which the cells began to further clump together and attach to the wall, which meant that they were sufficiently converting from monocytes to macrophages. So after converting the blood samples of our KO and TG mice and the THP1 cells from monocytes into macrophages, 
we added LPS for time variables of 24 hours, 46 hours, and then we left one vial untreated to serve as our control group. With these differing time variables, we observed the production of resistance. We first fixed our sample vials of TG and KO with paraformaldehyde or PFA diluted with PBS. Furthermore, we added LPS for the aforementioned time variables. To begin the immunostaining process of all our samples, we blocked our solution using BSA or bovine serum albumin and NP40 to act as a detergent to permeabilize our cells. Moreover, the dyes we used include for the immunostaining process include DAPI to show the nucleus of our cells is blue, as well as Texas red to illustrate the resistant expression as red and including one with no staining labeled as BF or bright field. In this slide, you can see the, our IgG um, schematic view or immunoglobin G um, in, in which um, our primary antibody, AKA anti-resistant conjugates with biotin, which binds to the protein avidine conjugated by Texas red to display resistant expression as red. As aforementioned, we also added um, that be to display the nucleus of our cells as blue and one vial with no immunostaining labeled as BF and or bright field. Um, this slide shows the immunostaining of our cells after adding LPS for 46 hours. These are the uh, TH fuel samples. The blue represents uh, the nucleus and the red uh, illustrates resistant expression. Here in this slide displays the immunostaining of our THP1 sample after having LPS treatment for 24 hours. As you can see from the last picture, the resistant expression was more elongated than circular. And then in the following slide. These are the untreated samples. Uh, the resistant expression is still very apparent and circular, similar to our four to six hour samples but they were still relatively elongated. And then this slide not only include, includes a composite microscopic image of DAPI and Texas Red, but also our BF or bright field in which our observations previously mentioned still withstand in which there is um, a lot of resistant expression even in the untreated um, THP1 sample. Um, there is a limited amount of cells that can be gathered when extracting blood cells from animals. When we were immunostating our KO and TG samples, there weren't enough cells visible to accurately analyze resistant expression. And as such, we had to repeat the same process of converting PBMCs to macrophages um, using blood cells collected from the bone marrow of another TG mice in order to see if there was any resistant expression. That, however, was not the case. Uh, leading to our KO and TGMI samples being inconclusive. If time permitted, we may have had the opportunity to repeat this experimental process in hopes that our results will render more fruition. Additionally, since THP1 cell culture samples are a more well-established model for humans, we were able to experiment with the immunostaining process by using um, different dyes to illustrate the resistant expression. So we once again used avidine, the protein avidine to display resistant expression as red via Texas red, as well as an anti-mouse um, secondary antibody from rabbit known as Fitzy, meant to display resistant expression as green. And another secondary antibody from um, donkey slash goat that is also anti-mouse to illustrate resistant expression also as red. However, the results from these new immun immunostaining processes are also currently inconclusive. Despite how our KO and TGMI samples were inconclusive, we were still able to view resistant expression by our THP1 sample. Resistant expression in our THP1 24 hour treatment sample was elongated compared to our four to six hour LPS. However, what was more surprising was how our LPS untreated samples still expressed a vast majority of resistant expression, which may suggest that the accelerated resistant expression was the result of A, 
another type of irritative stimuli or be a result of a procedural mistake. However, this could also occur because the body still produces resistance via macrophages without irritative stimuli like LPS. Regardless of our results, our lab experience this summer included a plethora of fringe benefits, including how to, how to manage lab equipment such as microscopes and pipettes and training for proper animal handling while enforcing general laboratory safety procedures. Additionally, we enhance our research skills and expand our understanding of a condition not many people are familiar with. But most importantly, we were able to further embrace our ignorance and failures and use them to gain more confidence about asking questions in the laboratory setting. In fact, some of those questions include, can atherosclerotic plaque regress over time through lifestyle changes? Whether carnivores have more difficulty developing atherosclerosis than omnivores and herbivores? Could blocking the TL4 receptor be a potential form of treatment to decrease resistant expression and arterial inflammation? And finally, if HDL protects the body from atherosclerosis, what specific mechanism enables its protection? Um, to conclude our presentation, we want to thank Dr. Zhao, um, Dr. Hader, and Dr. Molly for letting us participate in their lab this summer, as well as mentor us in their experimental processes. We also want to thank uh, Dr. Weedy, uh, Grace Wagner, Grace Ann Thompson, Rosemary Alvarado, and Juan Ruiz for this wonderful summer experience and allowing us to better understand how research is conducted and most importantly, how to embrace our ignorance and curiosity. And these are our, our work cited page. Um, is there any questions? We have a quick question. Is Wei here at all or is she operating too? <laughs> um, I don't think um, Dr. Zhao is here, but Dr. Vader, who was our primary lab mentor during the summer is here, but. Oh, Dr. Hader, do you want to just make a comment very, very quick? I'm not sure if his mic works. Oh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Well, th this was a remarkable morning. Uh, a morning of, uh, of your presentations are remarkable, your PowerPoints, uh, everything about your very poised presentations. This could have been faculty presentations, as far as I'm concerned, the quality of the work was outstanding. Your graphics were outstanding. Okay, so we are a little over in time. Uh, we'll have just a very brief breather. I don't know, Juan, uh, how long is, um, is your video uh, presentation gonna take? Uh, till we start the next session. Okay, sure. so we'll, we'll get started yeah. on the videos. Unfortunately, we're not in person to have lunches, which is what we usually have. I hope you guys and gals brought uh, something to eat with you. Uh, and certainly you can do that at this time, uh, but we're gonna go ahead then with the, the videos. So uh, we'll get through as many as, as we can. And then tomorrow at the end uh, of day two presentations, we'll show the rest, okay? okay? Uh, I've gone ahead and I've randomized all of your videos. So go ahead and grab some popcorn, grab your lunch, um, and enjoy these magnificent, magnificent videos. Okay. Can you give us a hint as to the order, Juan, now that you've randomized them? Yeah, you'd like to know who? Oh, well, go okay. ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Can you see this? This is the list right here. This is oh, how we're okay. going. Right here. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Jared, um, Alex, Lillian, Sophia, uh, Boaz, Yasmin, Eric, and then the rest are going to be a surprise. Okay. okay, can you see the screen? It's just empty, correct? No, it's got the landscape on it. Right, okay. Let me make sure. 
And these videos were all made by the students on their phones? Most of them, yeah. Some mm -hmm. used, uh, one second. some used their Zoom. I thought that was very interesting. There we go. Can we see Jared here? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hello, my name is Jared Fisher and I'm a sophomore at the University of Arizona. This summer, I worked under Dr. Rajesh Khanna and Dr. Obin Mattel. And in the Khanna lab, we focus on pain. Overall, we were trying to answer the question, how can we regulate chronic pain? Chronic pain is a pain state that can persist for months after initial injury or illness. With millions of people suffering from this condition, one of our only solutions are highly addictive opioids. In the Kana Lab, we are trying to develop non-opioid drugs to treat chronic pain to stop feeling the opioid crisis. This summer, I got to perform a unique set of experiments to help our lab better understand chronic pain and ways to treat it. Primarily, I studied a condition known as perineoplastic syndrome a state where cancer patients can experience pain. With this syndrome, patients develop autoimmunity against a protein called CRIMP5. To study this pain state, I printed CRIMP5 peptides onto slides and applied rat antibody serums, which bonded to the peptides. After this, I was able to image the slides with fluorescence, which allowed me to track binding interactions with CRIMP5 peptides. By studying these interactions, we gain a better understanding of the physiology behind CRIMP5 autoimmunity that causes this chronic pain state. As of now, the results of this experiment are not conclusive. Further experimentation would be needed to conclude which peptide of the CRIMP5 protein is related to autoimmunity-related pain states. What we do know is that pain is universal, and the implications of this research are endless. As the summer draws to a close, I have a few more questions I would like to look into. How can we apply what we know from other autoimmune disorders to our research on CRIMP5 autoimmunity? How can research on this pain state be used to better understand chronic pain states as a whole? How can I alter the protocol of my experiment to collect more accurate results? Amazing. Thanks for starting off, Jared. Our next video is by Alex, who's a veteran at this now. Oh, it's Alex is waiting. Okay, yeah. Alex had uh, another fellowship during the summer, but he did mentor students in the Falk Lab as well. Hi, I'm Alex. I am an alumnus of the SIMI program and a current mentor for it as well having been in the Fox Sherman lab since the start of uh, my time in the program back in 2016. We study Parkinson's disease in the lab and primarily look at novel therapeutics for either treatment of Parkinson's or the serious side effect uh, of patients taking levodopa, which is the gold standard for treatment. Um, and this side effect is known as levodopa induced dyskinesia. So we have actually shown that in preclinical rodent models, levodopa induced dyskinesia is treated by ketamine in sub-anesthetic doses. And we also know that ketamine acts upon a variety of systems in the body, mainly the NMDA and the opioid receptor. So we will be looking at whether naloxone, which is a opioid receptor antagonist, actually has an effect on limiting ketamine's ability to attenuate LID. In order to induce Parkinson's in the rodents, we lesion them on one side of the brain with 6-hydroxydopamine, or otherwise known as 6-ODA, which is a neurotoxin that selectively destroys dopaminergic cells. And we do this via a surgery with a hole made into their skull and a needle, a micro-injection needle, actually delivering the neurotoxin to the site where we want to destroy those uh, dopamine cells. To confirm the lesion, we administer the amphetamine rotation test seen on the left, where the animals are given D-amphetamine, which makes them turn in one direction due to asymmetric dopamine release. And given enough turns, we can include them in the study. On the right, we have levodopa-induced dyskinesia, 
and that is what we'll use to determine if naloxone actually has made an effect since ketamine should reduce LID scores. Alrighty, thank you, Alex. Next up, we have Lillian. My name is Lillian German. I am from Wilcox, Arizona. I just graduated from Wilcox High School and I will be attending the University of Arizona this fall to major in psychology. This summer I had the opportunity to work at the Dr. Sherman Lab where my mentor Alex took on the task of teaching me and mentoring me through my summer medical ignorance experience. The lab that I'm working with this summer focuses on translation medicine for Parkinson's disease. I have noticed that there are a lot of research projects going on around me, but they all have one thing in common and that is treatment. Bettering treatment is not only important to this lab but also on a global scale because it is important that we have the best treatment possible for Parkinson's disease patients. Improvement of treatment for Parkinson's disease is important because Parkinson's disease is the second most common neurodegenerative disease after Alzheimer's. It is characterized by tremors, rigidity, and difficulty walking. Cognitive decline is most common at later stages of the disease. To conclude, some of the benefits that I gained this summer include insight to new career paths, running IHC, rodent handling, which is a skill that could possibly be used in the future, um, analyzing and dissecting research, medical research data, and experience of what it would be like to work at a research facility. Even though a lot of my initial questions were answered, so my three final questions are, how can we be more inclusive of the female community in treatment research for Parkinson's disease? How can Parkinson's disease treatment be tested on other animal models such as snails? And how can we get better treatment to the aging population and make it more available for them? Oh, did I just stop that? Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Lillian. Up next, we have Sophia Buchanan. Hi, my name is Sophia Buchanan, and I'm an incoming senior at Basis Tucson North. This summer, I had the opportunity to work in Dr. Slepian's lab, which focuses mainly on cardiology-based research. My lab has several areas of research, which include microfluidic chips, electrospinning, motion research, and research on the artificial heart. I will be discussing the areas of research that I was able to shadow this summer. Microfluidic chips are used to observe the motion of platelets in vessel-like channels. This allows us to see how blood flows when it is exposed to different environments, such as an environment with collagen. Electrospinning is used to learn about drug delivery methods as well as tissue regeneration. It consists of a pump that excretes a polymer, which is spun through a current and onto a conductor. The artificial heart was my main focus of research this summer. It is an artificial organ that is used as a substitute for a real human heart when the patient needs a transplant and can't get one. One of the goals of the lab is to see how an artificial heart could perhaps be a permanent substitute for a real heart instead of waiting for a transplant. My lab is in possession of two drivers, one called the Big Blue Driver and the other one called the Companion One Driver or also known as the C1 driver. The goal of my experiment was to discover how the two drivers compared to one another and also how their DPDT or their change in pressure over time compares to the human heart. 
As of the date that this is being filmed, I do not have the data to present, but it will be in my presentation. Here are the remaining questions I have after the conclusion of my experiments. Since cardiac muscle is so adaptable and malleable, is it possible to create a material in the artificial heart that will allow it to have these qualities? Is it possible to create chemical sensors that will react to bodily hormones that will then tell the heart to change its pumping mechanisms in response to these chemicals? And finally, can the driver deal with high afterloads or high blood volumes exerted out of the heart and into the body? Very good, thank you, Sophia. Now we have uh, Boaz. Hello, my name is Boaz Mayo, and I am an undergraduate student at the University of Arizona. I'm currently in my junior year, and I'm pursuing a physiology degree. I'm working at the Doyle Lab with Dr. Christian Doyle. Our research focuses primarily on the role of the immune system in recovery from stroke and the effect of stroke on Alzheimer's disease. Our lab's main question is, how can we improve recovery from stroke? The reason why we study this question is because there is no current medication for stroke. And in the United States, every year, 795,000 people develop a stroke. And we know that stroke is a major cause for serious disabilities. And furthermore, 30% of stroke patients will go on to develop dementia within months of their stroke. And so some of the experiments that we do in this lab to further analyze this question is we cauterize the middle cerebral artery in mice to model the human stroke. After that, we conduct several behavioral tests, such as a ladder rung test, which tests their motor capabilities. Following that, we harvest the mice and we section their brains and mount them on slides so that we can see them under microscopes. This is where we can see if our drug had an effect on their stroke recovery. One of the results that we found from analyzing immunoglobulin is that we found out that one of the drugs we've been testing has a profound effect on scar formation on tissue following stroke. One of the questions that I still have to this day is do sickle cell mice recover differently from stroke? Another question that still remains prevalent with me is does the drug cyclodextrin have an effect on scar tissue following stroke? And finally, is there a clear correlation between dementia and stroke? Clearly, there are still so many questions left unanswered, and so the research must go on. Thank you. Very good job, boys. That was great. Uh, up next, we have Yasmin and Vic. That's a great frame right there. Hello, my name is Yasmin Almasal, and I'm a junior here at the University of Arizona. And this summer, I'm working in Dr. Pablo Pires' lab in the Department of Physiology. Hi, my name is Victor Sengste Briet. I'm a freshman here at the University of Arizona and will be majoring in physiology. I'm currently studying with Dr. Pires' lab, who is also in the Department of Physiology. The main objective of Dr. Peters' lab is understanding the blood flow of brain in disease states. The current animal models we're using are known as 5X FED, also known as having the familial Alzheimer's disease. This summer, I was able to help on the project that targets the trp 4 gene and the use of vasoactive compounds such as GSK and HD606. We harvested the superficial and deep cervical lymphatic vessels in the 5X FED and wild type mice. By doing this, we're able to use these same vessels in what is known as a technique as pressure myography. By doing pressure myography, we're able to create a graph that compares the movement diameter of time in comparison to the length of the experiment to be able to track uh, the vasoconstrictions and vasodilations of these vessels. In this clip, we have a successfully cannulated superficial cervical lymphatic vessel. During this experiment, we treated the vessel with 3 nanomolar GSK proclaimed TRPV4 activator. As you can see, it constricts and dilates per the physiological environment we stimulated. At the end of the project, I was able to have a couple questions that continue to linger on. These questions include, how can the use of these vasoactive compounds translate to clinical care in regards to lymphatic complications? A second question I have lingering is, are the results of these vasoconstriction and vasodilations applicable to research of other body systems and organs? 
In the lab, we use various genetically modified mice. This summer, my project was to genotype these mutations for preceding experiments. For genotyping, there are five main steps. In the first step, we use DNA extraction. Then we, send, we do PCR, then gel electrophoresis. Afterwards, we cut out the gel with the DNA, do a DNA extraction out of the gel. Once we extract the DNA from the gel, we send it off for sequencing in another lab. During DNA extraction, we use various detergents, buffers, and incubation periods to isolate raw DNA from unnecessary matrices. PCR is necessary for copying billions of DNA sequences. There are three main steps, denaturation, annealing, and extension. Denaturation separates the double helix into single-stranded DNA. The annealing stage occurs when primers bind to target sequences to distinguish which sequences to amplify. Extension occurs when polymerase creates new DNA copies from the existing base pairs. Extension stage doubles the amount of copied DNA and amplifies targeted DNA sequences. Soon after, we prepare an agarose gel, then load the extracted DNA for a process called gel electrophoresis. Gel electrophoresis uses electrical current to pull slight negatively charged DNA molecules toward the positive electrode through the agarose pores. The pores help indicate genetic presence based on the molecular size of DNA. DNA gel extraction consists of physically cutting out the indicated gel band. The gel extraction also utilizes detergents, buffers, and centrifugal techniques to separate the gel from the raw DNA. Throughout the summer, I have experienced some lingering questions. Without DNA, how would cells generate unique characteristics with their structure and function? If lymphatic vessels in the brain have an increased permeability, can amyloid beta proteins leak through the vessel? Thank, Thank you, you for, for watching, watching our video! video. <laughs> nice work to both of you. All right, our next contestant is uh, Eric DeLeon. In a typical year, 6.8 million Americans break a bone each year. Unfortunately, some will not have another choice than to get their body limb amputated. Hi, my name is Eric DeLeon. I'm an undergraduate senior in biomedical engineering at the University of Arizona. My mentors, are Dr. Margolis and Dr. Sivik. Currently in my lab, we are trying to regenerate bone using scaffolds. My lab's main research question is, how can we treat a patient with a 42 millimeter bone defect? Currently, there's not a gold standard method to treat a large bone defect. My lab is trying to answer this question by using a plastic scaffold loaded with stem cells and inserting it into the affected bone area. By doing so, we'll then regenerate the bone back. This will then create a gold standard procedure that would be more affordable for the world. This summer, I had the pleasure of analyzing lots of sheep videos. This consists of documenting if the sheep was standing, moving, or laying down. This can be used to determine if the sheep was active or not. The results are still inconclusive, well, I did notice that there was one sheep that did not like to move. This will then be used to determine if the sheep movements had an effect on the bone growth. So the question that I still ponder is, does movement really have a big effect on bone growth? Or does the weight of the patient matter? Or another one is, is having a healthy diet increase your ability to grow bone? These are some questions I still to this day and hopefully by the end of the summer I will be able to answer them and uh, thank you for watching if you have any questions please leave in the comments below and please don't forget to like and subscribe <laughs> wow he did our job for us there right at the end nice extra points for that um, also extra points for the camisa negra in the back classic uh,
So good work, Eric. Thank you for that. Um, up next, we have Danielle. Hi, I'm Danielle Murcio, and my mentor in my lab is Dr. Hua. I'm currently a senior at Choi High School. My lab main research focus is the role of NHEH in the intestines. My lab, my lab question is, how can we thoroughly identify white type and knock out mice in order to find the NHEH protein? What my lab is mainly trying to find through its research is how NHEH, the protein, and mucin production are connected. With this, we are able to see how NHEH is directly involved in the mucin production. And this um, gives us hope in finding a cure to patients that suffer from um, alternative colitis and other diseases that are in the intestine. In order to find connections between NHEH and mucin production, we first have to find um, NHEH gene marks in the mice. And to do that, we do a technique called genotyping. It's basically, it tells us the genetic makeup of the mice and that allows us to see if the mice have NHEH protein. We can differentiate this gene by identifying if they are white type or knockout. White type meaning that they do contain the NHEH um, protein and knockout is that they don't contain the NHEH protein. What we mainly use for this technique is called a, a PCR technique that allows us to break down the DNA and copy it many many times over and over. We then create a gel called Algarose gel which once it solidifies we put it into a container with a TIA solution um, then we put it to a voltage well then the solution will run to a positive charge then after that we put it in a machine um, that takes and it will show us a result whether it is knockout or white type now our results came out great um, as you can see, it's, it came out clear, and with this information, we can see that there are white types and there are what we call heterogeneous. When one parent has the NHEH gene and the other does not, we mainly use heterogeneouses as breeders. After genotyping, we could further do experiments with white type and knockout mice to be a step further to discovering the the importance of NHEH in the mucin production. Thank you. All right, nice job, Danielle. Thank you. Uh, now we have uh, Samara. My name is Samara Casanera, and I go to Toya High School. Um, going into my senior year, I'm and the main type of research my lab focuses on is IBD, which is inflammatory bowel disease. And the main question is, how can we treat patients with inflammatory bowel disease? And there is a rising number of people living with IBD. Approximately 1.6 million Americans currently have IBD. There is a link between IBD and cancer that there is greater risk of developing colon cancer if a patient already has IBD. This reflects the need for more research to find a cure. My lab conducts the research of the role of ADP ribose polymerase 1, which also stands for PARP1, in experimental colitis by using mice. My remaining questions are, can there be a therapeutic role for nicotine or cannabis in the treatment of IBD? And how can pain be most effectively managed in people with IBD? And is self-guided management effective and does it improve outcomes, quality of life, and function in inflammatory bowel disease? Very nice, uh, very quick to the point. Thank you, Samara. Now we have uh, 
Vivek. Hi there, my name is Vivek Hakim. I'm a rising third year at the University of Arizona. This past summer, I worked in Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Sagul's lab under the supervision of Ian, Marcella, and Akash. This lab focuses on how to treat pulmonary hypertension through the manipulation of a gene called CHAT. This lab wants to understand the role that CHAT has in pulmonary hypertension. Therefore, I decided to spend my time this summer learning about polymerase chain reaction and how to correctly genotype mice. To start this technique, we have to purify DNA through a series of bats that extract the DNA from tail tips using various solutions. After that, we add primers, which allow the replication of DNA to occur. We also add nucleus-free water and a ready mix, which is comprised of our four base pairs, a tag polymerase, and other constituents which allow replication to occur. In order to allow all these constituents to work together, they need to reach a certain temperature. Therefore, we use this machine called a thermocycler, which allows it to reach three steps. They need a naturing step, annealing step, and extension step. Using a gel, we can load in our samples post replication. Then using an electron current, we can allow for our desired DNA to run across the gel, separating between each other based on their base pair size and overall negative charge. We can see what alleles are which by comparing them next to a DNA ladder. After we run the gel, we can see that these white bright lines appear the bottom one is our Cree gene, which allows for DNA recombination to occur on the mice. Next white line that we see is our positive control, which allows us to know that our experiment ran correctly. Lastly, the last two lines that we see on the very top are our wild type and mutant chat genes that we are looking for. So after my experiment, I definitely had a lot of questions to ask. The first being, why we saw so many Cree genes pop up in our gel? when definitely shouldn't be that frequent. The second question was, what protein are we looking for when we look at our positive control, since they could be any structural protein? And lastly, I was wondering if you could use this genotyping technique to verify if other DNA samples are correct after their experiment. Very nice. Thank you for that. Uh, now we have Tawanda. We're going to try to go a little faster here. Hello, my name is Tawana Zivamwe. I am a junior at the University of Arizona. I'm studying physiology with a minor in biochemistry and emergency medicine. I work at the dark, I work in Dr. Slepian's biochemistry and medical BME lab. So what we have here is some of the old projects that they've been working on. They primarily focus on platelets and ethnic Williamson, them. And we try to learn how uh, planets aggregate and what we can better do for them. So one of the future projects that I plan on working on in the future after the summer program <coughs> is trying to understand how we can test um, blood transfusion and see if we can better rate them to see which one would be better for having patients who are hemorrhaging to potentially stop them. So as we walk in, we have the lab itself. Uh, we have where we the donors come in and donate blood. We use human samples in here. Um, what I do and I've been helping on is uh, when a donor comes in, we get the blood sample. We spin it down to separate them into popping. What we do is, what we have here is a slide size exclusion tomography. So we do is put the GFP in there and extract platelets. Um, what we can do is then run further experiments. There's about 10 experiments that go on in the day, so it's really important that we be able to correctly get the samples out. To what we have. Here we have a comment, which can tell us how much um, how much the platelets are in there about so we can make sure we're using the right actual measurements. But uh, I've been the NIH summer program has been really um, a great thing for me to this summer. I've really learned a lot, especially to ask questions, ask the right questions too. Not only that, but help me find information for myself and make me a better scientist in the future. Hopefully, I can continue this lab and maybe contribute something in the future. Thank you. All right, thank you, Tawanda. We'll move right on forward to Daniel.
Hi, my name is Daniel Moya. I currently go to Campo Verde High School and I'm going to be a junior this year. I have three mentors, Abilasha Viswanate, Gabe Ogine, and um, Stephen Cohen. Our research lab focuses on how to treat level dopa induced dyskinesia using ketamine to alleviate dyskinesia. But our lab's main research question is how do neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's affect aging, memory, and behavior in rats? Our lab wants to find an answer to this question because there is so much we don't know about neurodegenerative diseases and they want to find ways to alleviate symptoms and potentially even a cure to these diseases. Um, it is important that our lab finds an answer to this question because if we find a better treatment for a neurodegenerative disease that affects both animals and humans, then there is a possibility that this treatment could help someone who is suffering from a disease like Parkinson's. So at the moment, our lab wants to find out if injecting ketamine to Parkinsonian rats suffering from dyskinetic symptoms could counteract their jumpy and uncontrollable movement. We will help handle the rats or we will help uh, Abilasha uncoil the wire that is connected to the chip that records the neurons in the rat's brain. Because when the rat was moving uncontrollably, um, he will sometimes spin around in just one direction and he will coil the wire. Our lab still has to finish the experiment by the intraperitoneal injection of Levodopa Academy for, work for one of our rats. And an intraperitoneal injection is just an injection in the belly. So we were able to see that the rat returned to slightly normal movements for 30 minutes and he became dyskinetic and then Parkinsonian again, but our lab still needs to conduct more experiments to see if there are different results. Um, some questions that I still have are, what program did they use to track the data given by the tetrodes? Why did a rat return to normal movements for a short period of time and other times the injection didn't work? How do we know the tetrodes are in the right region of the brain. Right, good questions. All right, uh, thank you, Daniel. Up next, we have the uh, very involved in the chat, uh, Anthony. He's really enjoying himself there. That's great. Hey everyone, my name is Anthony Nunez Romero. I'm currently a rising junior here at the University of Arizona, and I am in Dr. Savek's orthopedic research lab. My mentors include Dr. Savag, Dr. Margolis, and Dave Gonzalez. So we'll put on our masks and we'll head on inside and I'll show you guys all the stuff that I do in my lab. Our lab's main research question, to put it simply, is how can we regrow bone? The reason why we are trying to solve this issue is because large lung bone defects commonly occur in humans in the form of cancer resections, motor vehicle accidents, and other sorts of trauma. Now you may be thinking, aren't there other surgical treatments that already exist? Well, the issue with those is that they're very costly and effective, and overall, they're just not that good. But what we're trying to do is by implementing a 3D printed biomimetic scaffold, and we see that with endogenous stem cells, we can then regrow bone ourselves, and it takes a lot less money and a lot less surgical intervention, and overall, it's better for the patient. The results I've gathered in this lab so far show that we are in fact consistently growing bone in these uh, experimental samples with the scaffolds. Um, I have been able to gather quite a few measurements using ImageJ and actually I have been able to have enough results to even present a poster which you'll see here. Also um, during my time in this internship I have had the opportunity to ask myself a ton of questions. Uh, a few of the questions that I have had is how can we safely start clinical trials? Because we have only been testing this in sheep femora, so being able to do this in humans would be very, very effective. And another question that we had is instead of using bio and nerve materials for the scaffolds, how can we create a material that isn't going to just stay in the person forever and will also disintegrate? And what other measurements can we gather from the sheep femora, whether it be axial load, uh, torsional strain and other types of measurements like that using strain gauges. Nice, very good job. Good work, Anthony. Thank you. Uh, I believe, do we have time for one more? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Now we'll have uh, Isaac. Hello, my name is Isaac Rojas. I currently attend Pueblo Manor High School here in Tucson, going to be a junior. 
the next steps, hopefully, are going to go to college and become an anesthesiologist. I work in the Falk Sherman Laboratory with my mentor, Alex Vieira. The lab works with male rats who have Parkinson's disease. We do a unilateral surgery to make them Parkinson's disease. One of the lab's main focus is how can we help those who have liver with dyskinesia? How can we make the lives easier? A few things that I have learned this summer is IHC, DAB, behaviors, and reading medical term papers and trying to explain it on my own. As you can see on the screen, there's two types of holding methods that are on there. One is a T-Rex script and the one is a four-limb crisscross method. In our lab, we normally use the four-limb crisscross method because it's easier to inject them in the IP space. This next photo that you see is where you hold the rat. You normally use your index, thumb, and middle finger to grab the base of their tail. If you were to grab the middle or the tip of their tail, the skin could come off the tail and possibly either get an infection or it can actually kill them. Very interesting. Thank you, Isaac. Um, well, we've hit the one o'clock uh, time. Okay. Are we about half through the videos? Yeah, we've actually hit the, the halfway there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll finish those at the end of tomorrow. Is that the plan? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're going to go on then to, um, to Vivek Aking, uh, who's an undergraduate at the University of Arizona, and he worked with Dr. Ahmed, uh, who's Associate Professor of Pediatrics. And let's try to keep to our time. All right, hello there. My name is Vivek King. This past summer, I was fortunate enough to work with Dr. Hoffman in his lab. I focused on genotyping and PCR, and um, I'll get into that in a minute. So in this lab, we focus on how to treat pulmonary hypertension, but it's important to know what it is. So it's simply the high blood pressure in the pulmonary artery that supplies the lungs, right? So on the right here, we see a normal heart with proper sized cavities and the blood vessels and the lumen are of normal size. On the left, we have a diseased heart and a diseased condition, which is a low O2 environment. When that happens, the right ventricle is slightly enlarged. There's a constant constriction of blood vessels and the lumen is very, very tight and small. When this happens, the blood, the, the uh, sorry, the heart has to work overtime to supply the lungs with a proper amount of blood, but that blood isn't properly oxygenated. So the lungs don't get um, the amount of oxygen they really need to function properly. Um, so what's a big lab question? Um, it's how we can treat hypertension via the manipulation of a gene called CHAT. So my initial questions. When I was coming in, into this lab, I, I didn't really know what to expect. So I, um, I just want to know what I would be doing, what procedures I'll witness, what techniques I'll perform. I also wanted to um, know what CHAT is and how it relates to hypertension. I also wanted to look at uh, what genotypes um, I'll look for in these mice. And it's kind of, that's kind of the big question I focused on these past few weeks. So um, in this lab, I was able to witness a variety of things. Um, one of the first few days there, I was able to um, harvest the organs from mice. And you, using those tissues, we um, ran a Western blot protocol in which we were able to measure the proteins that were in each of those tissues. I also got a witness for plasma purification is as well as what the polymerase chain reaction does, which basically creates enough DNA to be used for mice genotyping. I also looked at um, various other projects, um, such as uh, mice hy hy hypoxia ischemia, which is the process of um, that would um, um, that's stimulated by the um, tying up the carotid artery in the in, in, in the uh, mouse. I also looked at what induced mice hypoxia is, which is simply placing a healthy mice in a oxygen low chamber to see what happens and just analyze what happens to the mice. So what is CHAT? Um, the CHAT gene codes for a protein called choline acetyltransferase. That protein 
facilitates the production of a molecule called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine will bind to receptor proteins on muscle cells, allowing for the flow of ions to occur through the muscle, uh, which causes the contraction of blood vessels. This constant and continuous vasoconstriction of blood vessels is what hypertension is. So this last question um, was answered through mouse genotyping, which is the big project that I focused on. And that can be split up in three phases. The first one is tissue digestion, in which we isolated raw DNA from the cell tips using various baths and lysis solutions. Using that raw DNA, we add three constituents, primers, attack polymerase, and then DNMPs, which is basically the four uh, base pairs that are just used as raw fuel to allow replication to occur. After we take that replicated DNA, we, um, we add that solution into a gel, and then we're able to separate the solution based on their um, DNA base pairs. And after you run it under a uh, machine, you're able to get an image that looks like this. Now it may look kind of complicated, so I'll explain it the best as I can. These bottom bands that we see here are Cree, and that allows for DNA recombination to occur and allows us to um, manipulate chat to our liking. So in this case, we want it to, um, to be excised. This next band that we see is a positive control. That just allows us to know that we did our experiment correctly and everything that led up to this uh, final result was done correctly. The next band is our um, chat mutant. And that's the chat that we want because that chat can be manipulated. It can be excised. It can stay the same. That's, that's, that's the chat that we're looking for. And the next band on the very top is our wild type chat. And that's the chat that, um, that just doesn't have any sort of um, ability to be manipulated. So in essence, uh, we want our mice to be positive for Cree. So we want them to have the bottom band and have the chat mutant. Um, that's the chat that can be uh, um, excised from the genome. So what are some benefits I learned from this lab? Um, definitely the collaborative team skills that go into a lab setting. Um, you definitely have to work with other people. Every experiment has various minds working in harmony. So being able to collaborate with each other is very, very important. And that's something that I learned. Also, you have to be very, very accurate and precise when um, pipetting, you know, reading instructions and just knowing what you're doing or else you won't get the results that you want to. So that's something I really had to get used to. I had to kind of slow myself down and read every instruction very, very carefully to know that um, I'm doing it uh, the proper way. And lastly, it's how to troubleshoot, how to make your experiment better. You know, these past, um, this past year, all of my academic labs were online. So I didn't really get the opportunity to uh, troubleshoot. Everything was spoon fed to me. So being in this lab, it really helped me learn how to properly um, just better my experiment and change my ways in order to get better results. So what are some questions that remain? The first one would be how to quantify the measure whether the excision of chat has a significant amount of hypertension. This is basically what the lab question is all about. But I want to see if we get if I can use Western blot, blot protocols and um, rotating PCR to see this um, to see the measurement. That's something I didn't really get to witness in this lab. So hopefully within the next week or two I can do that. Also, um, we saw some a lot of Cree bands show up, and it definitely shouldn't be as frequent as um, it did. And that could be due to a lot of reasons. Um, my guess is that the primers are contaminated, so it's just. Um, overexpressed in Cree when I shouldn't. And I think that can be figured out through continued research as well. So with that being said, I just want to thank Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Sugul for allowing me to work in the lab, as well as Akash, Marcel, and Ian, who kind of showed me the ins and outs. Um, it definitely opened up my eyes as to what I can do in the STEM field. So I, I just want to say thank you. And also to the SEMI staff for allowing us to continue our research, even during the COVID pandemic. I'm sure it's helped us all. So uh, thank you, and I'd love to answer any questions. Okay, hey, do we have a question? How about one question? Anybody? I have one. Are you measuring the amount of choline and sodium transferase produced in the lab or the expression of the chat gene? Um, that's a great question. So we're actually measuring. So what you just said is um, kind of the same thing. So the expression of chat is the production of the protein 
um, colon zero transfer. So in essence, we're looking at both. Okay, uh, then we're gonna move on to the next two presenters uh, who are Vivian Pham from the Sonoran Science Academy and uh, Ali Mod Rizal from Flowing Wells High School. And they worked with Dr. Robert Snyder, uh, who is a vision scientist and ophthalmologist, and he's also in the engineering school here. Uh, and uh, they're gonna present their work now. Can you guys uh, hear us fine into your screen? Mm-hmm. All right, okay. let's get started. All right, so I'm Vivian Pham. Um, I graduated Sonoran Science Academy and it'll be an upcoming um, freshman. Where are you going to be? At the U of A. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and I'm Ali Mode. I just graduated from Flowing Wells High School and I'll be at Stanford in the fall. Yes, so our lab um, deals with L-DOPA and macular degeneration. And we, as you heard Dr. Woody say, we work with Dr. Schneider at Tucson Eye Care. So to start off, like what is ophthalmology and to not be confused with optometry, ophthalmology is the um, study of medical conditions relating to the eye. So an ophthalmologist um, does medical and surgical eye care. So they take care of glaucoma and cataract surgeries. Optom um, optom uh, sorry, optometrists, um, they specialize with vision and eye care. So they're the one to give eye exams and um, give prescriptions. And then an optician, there's the one to fill out those uh, prescriptions and um, fit the frame for people. So how do we see? So we see, um, it's very similar to the functions of a camera. So we see that the pupil is the aperture of the camera. This is where the light enters, the iris and the diaphragm. This is the uh, dilation. This is the muscles that helps that causes dilation, so to allow different amounts of light in. The lens is the lens. They um, the bend, the bend the light, they focus the image. The um, choroid and the black paint. Now this um, comparison is made because the choroid is actually um, pigmented, so it's dark. And this is to protect the vessels from light toxicity. And then of course, the more most important part of the eye and the camera is the film. So this film is where the image, image comes to focus. So without the film, what we see would be very blurry and it wouldn't be clear at all. So we see in the structure of the retina here in this area, this is um, near where the macula is. So from here, when the light enters, it goes through all of these neurons to receive the image to the rods and the cones. Now the rods and the cones, they are, um, your photoreceptors. So the rods, they give you night vision. So this is um, your vision in lower light. Um, and also our peripheral vision, as you can see up in the diagram above, if you can see it. And then the cones, they are the color and the details. So, and they function in highlight. And that is the very center of our vision, as you can see up um, in this diagram as well. Now, in each of the um, photoreceptors, we have discs, and these discs are packed with rhodopsin, which is a light sensitive um, receptor protein. And these discs are replaced every, uh, once every 10 days, which would make sense as our eyes are very active and the amount of light that we see would be pretty damaging. Um, so if you, if you saw on the diagram on that previous slide, uh, there were layers of the retina and at the very bottom, uh, is the retinal pig pigment epithelium. We're just gonna call it the RP from now on. Uh, it has a bunch of different functions that are very uh, important to our lab and I'll go over a few of them quickly from right to left here. So light absorption. Uh, the uh, retinal pigment epithelium is called pigment because it has melanin uh, in it. And that's the stuff in your skin that protects you from UV radiation so that you don't, uh, so that you're, you don't get damaged by, by sunlight. Uh, and it works the same way here uh, because light uh, when it focuses and it reacts with the oxygen, it can oxidize uh, and cause damage to some of your tissue. So that melanin in that art in the RPE protects you from that. Uh, it also prevents light scattering. So light doesn't bounce around your eye and cause you to have like blurry or uh, different kinds of messed up vision. Uh, epithelial transport, uh, it, it regulates the transport of materials like water and ions uh, in, in and out of your eye. Um, it helps fuel the glia cells. 
uh, the visual cycle, this one's a little complicated. I won't go uh, too deep into the one. Basically, it's uh, it's like the like an energy, uh, and that like it's like it's like the energy cycle uh, for phagocytosis. Like she said, with uh, disc shedding, when your when your rods and cones uh, disc shed, the material needs to go somewhere. So the RPE phagocytosizes it uh, and and recycles the material, and then. For our lab, this secretion part is the most important. So there are two factors, VEGF and PEVF, and I'll go into what they are later, that are secreted by the RPE when different uh, agonists are attached to them. All right, so how is it that we look at the retina? So one of the ways that we look at the retina is through OCT scans, and you think of it as more of like an ultrasound for your eyes. So with the OCT scans, um, it allows you to see cross sections and 3D images of the retina. So you can physically scroll through the images or the scans and you'll see it cut through. And it is used to detect problems such as macular degeneration, glaucoma and diabetic retinopathy, which are the three main causes of blindness. So this is very cool. As you can see in the scans here, you see all the layers of the retina. And this dip right here, that's called fovea. And this is the pit inside the macula where all of your cones are located. So this is um, the center of your vision. Now onto the main uh, disease of this lab is age-related macular degeneration or AMD as we're gonna call it um, for the rest of the presentation. So this disease is the cause of central vision loss, as you can see down here where it's um, simulated. This is the vision of, this is what you would see if you have um, macular degeneration as, um, you still have your peripheral um, vision. However, the center is completely gone. Um, colors are very faded. And as you can see, um, as you can see very um, blurry. So there is no cure for this um, disease yet, but there are treatments for management and prevention. One of them being um, antioxidant vitamins, which were called um, AREDs. And then there are anti-VEGF um, injections and anti-VEGF or VEGF is just vacu or vascular um, endothelium growth factor. Yeah. yeah, so it's the growth of blood cells or blood vessels, my bad. So drusins are a huge part of um, AMD. They're um, the precursors to them. So when you see these little bumps um, underneath the um, RPE, um, this is a sign that it could progress into AMD. It, it won't always will, but there's a good chance that it might. So we don't know exactly what they are, but we do know that there are definitely lipids in there. So there's some fat. And we believe that it's a lot of the buildup from the disc shedding process that wasn't like that wasn't completely rid of. Um, yeah. And then here are questions. Yeah, so questions? after after all the pre-work, we have our initial questions and our lab questions. So when starting out, mine were how do clinical trials work? Because uh, I was told that we were going to be looking at some. How can you measure drusen? What does an ophthalmology clinic look like and how is research done in this field? Yes. And then mine was what is macular degeneration? And just by the sound of it, I, I just remind me of neurodegenerative diseases. So I, I wondered if it was one. Um, what are drusens and how do they form? And if there is an age-related macular degeneration, then is there a non-age-related macular degeneration? Uh, and then our main lab question at the end of the day is how can we cure uh, or prevent advanced macular degeneration? We'll get to what that is later too. So as you can see, this is a normal retina. Like Wait, there's no- Real quick, can you see our cursor on your screen or do we need to use like a, can you see move, Can cursor? you move it around? I believe we did see it before. Yeah, we see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, okay, awesome. Yeah, just making sure it's correct. Awesome. So you can see that this is a, a pretty normal, a normal retina. So it's nothing, you know, there's not, there's no abrasions. abrasions. Yeah, there, that's the word, abrasions on it. And if we look at the early AMD, we see some little speckles here. And these are pretty normal. 
um, nothing to worry about. Uh, everybody would get them in their lifetime, those speckles. And then when we move on to the um, intermediate AMG, we can see that these abrasions and inflammation have gotten visibly worse, as you can see these. And Drusen's, as I said before, they are precursors to both wet AMD and geographic atrophy, which is um, advanced stages of AMD. And these are what that looks like. So neovascular AMD, that is wet AMD. And this is when blood vessels, they grow into these Drusen's and leak fluid blood in it. So you have these horrible hemorrhages. And then ge with geographic atrophy, it is when, um, it's basically scars, like scars from the Drusen's and from the AMD. Um, and just uh, as you can see down here, it leaves pigment um, leaking and it's completely deflated. Okay, so uh, onto the drug that our clinical trials uh, surround, or sur uh, like are surrounded by. Uh, is L-DOPA and conveniently all the Parkinson's presentations happen for this one. So uh, I don't need to get too in depth into it. Uh, but like they said before, it is a precursor to dopamine uh, and it's primarily used in Parkinson's disease as a treatment. Uh, so I'm just introducing this here. Uh, but you may ask like, why is this L-DOPA which is used for neuro neurodegenerative disease used in your eye? Uh, well, uh, some work done before uh, by some really smart scientists, uh, they found out that L-DOPA is an agonist, which means it's a binding, uh, it's like a binding agent to a G-coupled protein receptor 143 uh, or GPR-143. And when it binds, uh, vascular endothelial growth factor or, or VEGF is downregulated. Uh, and what this is, so VEGF is a, um, it is a factor that promotes angiogenesis, which is when uh, it, it's that's uh, blood vessel growth, right? So when you get like a cut or an abrasion on your skin, your kerat keratinocytes, your skin cells will uh, produce VEGF uh, to promote blood vessels to grow so that it, it heals the wound. Um, also pigment uh, epithelial derived factor or PEDF is upregulated. Uh, the, the research on this factor isn't as well known, but we do believe that it has protective properties uh, against uh, AMD. And this, so the downregulation of VEGF and the upregulation of PEDF uh, is, uh, can result in protection against advanced AMD. Uh, and specifically for us, it will be wet AMD. Uh, so this was a, this was a paper, paper slash poster uh, published with Dr. Snyder. Uh, he was able to prove that L-DOPA has a positive, positive effect on wet AMD. So as you can see up here, this is a patient with pretty severe wet AMD. You can see the sub, uh, subretinal fluid. And then after uh, being prescribed L-DOPA, after a period of time, there, like the, all the subretinal fluid disappeared, which is extremely promising. Uh, and then uh, this graph shows the effect of L-DOPA on visual acuity, which is basically how well you can see. Uh, and as you can see here, after four weeks, uh, on average, patients uh, had an increase uh, in ability to see while on L-DOPA when they had wet AMD. So this brings up to uh, what we did in his lab, which is basically, does L-DOPA have, also have a positive effect on eyes that have not yet developed wet AMD? So what does this mean? Uh, the, so since Drusen precursed uh, wet AMD, we are trying to see if L-DOPA uh, in the other eye of the patient does not have wet AMD that, that have these drusens, if these drusens shrink while on L-DOPA. So basically uh, this, what you're seeing right here where the drusens shrink is what uh, is like a promising result that we're trying to see works. Yes. So what um, for our method, what we did was uh, we looked at these scans from the day the patient started treatment, the six month mark and the 12 month mark. And so we took, we take these scans and in the program that the things gives us, uh, we can create an overlay and trace out these Drusen's and measure um, the area of them in millimeter? Mill millimeter squared. Yeah, millimeter squared. Yes. You have patient. Number. Yes. So in this um, patient, in time zero, we can see that the Drusen measurements um, is 0 0.04 millimeter squared. And then we can see see that it progressed to 0.05 in the sixth month, 
and then finally 0 0.07 in the um, 12 month mark. So their juice in growth um, continued to progress and got a little bit bigger. Yeah. Uh, in patient B, uh, we see at time zero, it's 0 0.03 millimeters squared. At six months, it's also 0 0.03 and at 12 months, it's still 0 0.03. So here uh, we see that the drusen haven't grown and this is a good thing to see because as long as the drusen don't grow, that reduces the risk of having a uh, really severe AMD in the future. Excuse me. Uh, so this is, this is a good thing to see uh, and was a good result, but even better was patient C. Uh, we're at time zero, there are zero, 0 0.05 millimeters squared. Uh, at six months, they're at 0 0.02, and at 12 months, they stay at 0 0.02. So this was an instance uh, which their drusen shrunk, and this is this was like a very good thing to see. Um, uh, but th this was just for this specific patient, so we don't know uh, if L-dopa like was specifically attributed to that. Uh, and that's how we get into our results. So uh, on this this little table here. Uh, that those were all of our results, either plus minuses in the Drusen volume or Drusen area based on what slide we took. Uh, so average Drusen growth after 12 months was 0 0.0082 millimeters squared. Uh, average deviation was 0 0.014 millimeters squared. Uh, average percentage growth after 12 months was 20, uh, about 20. And then average uh, deviation of the points was 38.4. Um, so what does this mean? Well, uh, it doesn't really mean a lot right now. Uh, it's unfortunately inconclusive because uh, of multiple reasons. There's no uniform way of measuring Drusen. What does this mean? So we used we used a method by tracing over uh, a specific slide and seeing how much that area um, was that the program gave us. Um, but there could be someone else who finds true Drusen volume. There could be someone else who just does width height uh, of like Drusen base and Drusen height. Uh, so there's not, since there's not a uniform way, we can't really say, um, and we can't really find uh, an average Drusen growth since everybody's doing it differently. And, and compounding with that, there's very limited uh, literature on average Drusen growth over time for one year. So we have no baseline to compare to. Uh, if we did theoretically have one, and if it was like 0.005, uh, then our findings would be bad. And if it was 0 0.00, uh, or 0 0.01, then our findings would be good, but we don't have one, so we can't really say anything. Also, selection wasn't randomized. Uh, so um, we chose uh, patients to look at based on if they had quantifiable Drusen, which basically means uh, that they had big enough Drusen for us to see. Um, so because of that, that also messes up our statistical significance. Uh, so all of those combined uh, brings us inconclusive res uh, conclusions, but we still have results. Yes. However, what did we learn from this lab? Well, we got um, real life uh, clinical trial work, so we were able to experience that. And we learned how to find and quantify Drusen's using an OCT. So with our fringe benefits, um, we were we witnessed the process of getting a grant for studies. Um, Dr. Schneider, he gave us uh, his grant application to read over and make any edits if need be. So that was, that was nice. We also were able to shadow him. So we went um, around and saw patients with him. Um, we got to look at some patients' eyes as well. And then we learned how to use a slit lamp. And if you guys don't know what a slit lamp is, it's, it's this. So he taught us how to use a slit lamp. A lot of the nurses also helped us. So we now know how to use an equipment. So our, with our final questions. Uh, yeah, so my three final questions were what role does melatonin play in the development of AMD? Because uh, melatonin is also a really common over-the-counter uh, like a drug. Supplement. To, yeah, supplement. Um, to that, that like, uh, what's it called? But it, it affects your brain. Um, and then what other physiological pathways involve L-DOPA? Uh, and then how could other diseases affected by VEGF uh, be treated with anti-VEGF or L-DOPA? Yes, and then my um, final questions are, is AMD a circadian rhythm problem? Um, how big of a role does melanin play in our body as it played a part in AMD as well? And then what drugs have been repurposed before and how did that grant process go? Like, did it go smoothly? Was there a lot of bumps? 
And then our acknowledgements, of course, Dr. Snyder, he was great to us. Uh, he taught us a lot of things. Yes, and then our uh, the Tucson Eye Care tech, um, technical staff, they helped us out a lot. Um, so we'd like to thank Erica, uh, Saida, Reina, Lanessa, Nadar, uh, Patty, and Rachel, as well as Leanna. They were they're they're very wonderful. nice to us. They're all wonderful and super nice people. Uh, and then program thanks, of course, Dr. Witte, Ms. Grace Wagner, Ms. Grace Ann Thompson, Ms. Uh, Rosemary Alvarado, Juan and Brooke, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity again. Uh, yes, thank you. Any questions? Okay, some questions. Hey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have time for one or two questions. Um, since you said that um, melanin plays a significant factor in the progression of age-related macular degeneration, are there um, populations that are more affected than others? Yes, 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 <laughs> yes there is. Okay, um, yes. So age-related macular gener degeneration is much more likely to occur in light pigmented people or Caucasians. Um, this was a whole story with Dr. Snyder because when this was first found out, uh, the people looking at it initially, you know, these are big people in their field. They attributed it to uh, black and other minority communities not contributing to the database, um, which, you know, was seems uh, it's possible, but it just seemed less less possible than uh, melanin being the the factor in protecting against AMD. So, yes. yeah. Dr. Snyder and Dr. McKay, um, yeah. Have actually been very interested in L-dopa in albinism, you know, which is a condition uh, that uh, is um, highly prevalent in the, in the Navajo population. Where they studied that, where there's a lack of pigment, so mm -hmm. they've been making this connection across a number of disorders. And I think this is the next link they made. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you. And for being on time. Okay, we're going to go on to our last few presentations. And our next is uh, Genesis Ochoa. And she's from Bioscience High School in Phoenix. And I think she's starting at Grand Canyon and perhaps uh, transferring to the U of A. Uh, and she worked with Dr. Pereca and uh, Pablo Hernandez. Uh, and Dr. Pereca is Professor of Pharmacology and Anesthesiology. I'm kind of having trouble um, playing it, playing my presentation. Okay, I, I can go ahead and play it for you. Yes, um, please. I think I saw it. Yeah, here we go. Give me one moment. And folks, okay. put on your videos again. You've all lapsed into no videos. <laughs> all right, can you see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, you let me know when, I mean, I'll be paying attention, but uh, if I'm slow on changing the slides, you let me know, okay, Genesis? Okay. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm Genesis Ochoa, and I was recently placed um, in the PRECA lab this summer where I have been taught about pain. Today, I'll be discussing the importance of pain and how pain affects sleep. Okay, you can move on. All right, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, so my beginning questions that I accumulated at the beginning of the summer consist of, does pain affect sleep and vice versa, does sleep affect pain? So what is pain? Pain described by the IASP states that pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. Are you guys able to hear me? Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. thank you. So as you can see on the right side of the screen where physicians often ask their patients to rate their pain on a scale of zero to 10, zero being absolutely no pain at all and 10 being the absolutely worst pain that the patient can be in. The problem with this measurement is that 
pain is completely subjective and um, therefore it makes it difficult for physicians to treat their pain. So let's say for example, you suffer from a broken leg and you can rate your pain at a nine. When physicians often ask another person to rate their same, to rate their pain for the exact same injury, they can rate their pain at a seven. It all depends on the person's pain tolerance and therefore it makes it very difficult for people to treat pain. Okay, so the, as we start for the pathway of pain, um, pain travels by starting at the peripheral nerves. As you can see here, it is a fingertip. Um, it senses nocious stimuli, where nociceptors sense nocious stimuli. And this case, it is a pin needle. It is then transmitted into the first order neurons, where it then synapses onto the second order neuron where it crosses a dorsal horn. It then goes up the spinal cord and into the brain where pain is perceived, it's felt, and it's located. As we go through the descending, through the descending pathway, pain is modulated um, for the incoming, where incoming pain is modulated. In some chronic or dysfunctional types of pain, this process is affected and does not work adequately. So as we can see, nociception is in the finger while pain is in the brain. What this mean is like the saying that they say, it's all in your head. So pain is in the brain because it is where it's felt, it's located and where it's perceived. So why is pain important? Pain helps us keep out of harm in the moment by um, keeping us away from certain environmental stimuli. So for example, we touch a hot stove and our reflexes quickly pull away because we're in pain. So it helps us keep out of harm in the moment by saving as much tissue dam by saving as much tissue as we can. And pain helps us motivate us by um, avoiding certain places, objects, and certain temperatures. Of course, pain is an unpleasant experience for, for any of us. Uh, but the unpleasantness of this pain teaches us to make decisions and to keep out of harm in the future. So to keep up with the example that I that I brought up, touching a hot stove. Um, because of the experience that you went through, now you know from experience not to touch a hot stove again. So the modalities of acute pain include chemical, um, mechanical, and thermal. And examples of mechanical pain include a hammer to the knee, a paper cut, a splinter, et cetera. Mechanical pain can be dropping battery acid on yourself or ingesting a hot pepper, which includes capsaicin in it. When it comes to thermal pain, examples can be hand on a hot stove or gripping onto ice. So all of these achieve one thing, which is tissue damage, but it is done through all different kinds of modalities. So acute versus chronic pain, as um, through research provided by Dr. Pareka, the, un the unpleasant qualities of pain are essential in its physiological role to increase survival by promoting learning and influencing future decisions to avoid harm. Acute pain lasts less than three months, but as soon as this pain is longer than three months, it is considered to be chronic. Chronic pain is no longer a, a learning mechanism and has no apparent useful purpose. So acute pain is good because we can now learn through our mistakes and it's a learning mechanism, but once this acute pain turns chronic, it is no longer a learning mechanism for us to understand from. To dig deeper into my beginning questions, this infographic provided by the National Sleep Foundation on how pain affects sleep states that 21% of people who experience chronic pain only have 42 minutes of daily sleep of only 14 minutes of sleep debt. One in three people without chronic pain still don't get the proper sleep that they need in order to feel their best. And because of this, the lack of sleep that they experience affects their mood, their relationships, activities, and the quality of life. So all of this with chronic pain causing and sleep disruption causes a vicious cycle. We call this a vicious cycle because of how brutal this, this loop is set up. So let's say you're experiencing chronic back pain and because of the pain you're enduring, it causes sleep disruption or sleep that the night before. And because of the lack of sleep, it causes your pain to inflammate and making your pain so much worse than you had before. So um, chronic pain leads to sleep sleep disruption, sleep disruption leads to pain, and the cycle continues. Because of this, um, it answers our beginning question, pain does affect sleep. Well, how do we test this now? 
and it will be done in the next slide where we test it in the lab. So EEG and um, EEG stands for electroencephalogram and EMG stands for electromyography. This is um, an EEG of a human study. As we can see for the wake period, the frequency tends, the frequency is high and the amplitude is low. This may fluctuate depending on the context. Once we get to non-REM sleep, delta waves begin to increase. And as we reach to get lower, um, this, um, the amplitude begins to rise while the frequency begins to decrease. Once we get to REM sleep, theta waves begin to appear and the frequency begins to increase once again. Um, okay, so this is what we use for a head mounting surgery on the mice in our lab. We use EMG to make sure and measure that the mice are awake. We then place them into, into this glass cage where we are able to watch them over a two over a two week period. The same method, this same method can be used in mice as well. So this is the sleep cycle of the mice where it is split into the light and the dark phase. In the dark phase, you can see that the mice are more prone to be awake. This is due to the mice being nocturnal. In the light phase, we can see um, that the mice are in non-REM sleep. So as we can see in the bottom figure below, we see non-REM, REM, and wake in the mice, and this is all used through the power density of delta waves. The green waves represent that the mice are in non-REM sleep. The red waves are, represent that the mice are in REM. As you can see here, the, um, the REM seems to be much shorter than the non-REM. We use wake, and the black waves represent that the mice are awake. So in conclusion, this is the last slide of our experiment. We see the sleep cycle of a naive of a naive mice on the left, where in the light phase, where in the light phase the mice are more prone to be asleep as compared to the dark phase. As you see the sudden drop of the middle of the light and the dark phase, we can see that the mice are beginning to, to wake up as compared to the light phase. But, but then we conduct a PSNL surgery, which stands for partial nerve sciatic partial sciatic nerve ligation, where we partially, where we ligate the sciatic nerve. Um, here we can see in comparison, once we conduct the PSNL surgery, meaning that the mice are in chronic pain, um, PSNL mimics chronic pain, and therefore we can use this in the experiment for us to understand when it comes to um, this chart, we can now see that the PSNL surgery as, com as compared to the sham surgery, um, we can see that the mice are more prone to the lack of sleep. And therefore, this is why um, the amount of pain, the amount of pain um, affects sleep. So my ending questions at the end of the summer um, are where does the line begin as to acute pain turning into chronic pain and how does sleep affect pain? Which is a question that I, that through this experiment, I wasn't able to answer. So what will I do about these questions? So for now on, I'll be shadowing a lab mentor such as Dr. Robson, who has a specialty in this and I will be asking him a whole bunch of questions and continuing in his research. I will also plan to conduct my own research or use this as my college thesis where I will continue to answer this question. Okay, thanks, Genesis. Do we have a couple of questions? And are any of your lab team here? Yes, Dr. Frank Pareka is here. Oh, okay. Uh, Frank, do you want to comment? Uh, really beautiful graphics there. Uh, hi, Marlies, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Hi. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. This is a this is a um, a very very common uh, uh, phenomenon that uh, we know that uh, there's uh, sleep disruption in so many individuals that suffer from chronic pain. Mm -hmm. um, and what's very very interesting is that um, uh, we we know that pain does affect sleep, but uh, the uh, effects of sleep on pain are actually much more prominent, much more significant. And so disruption of sleep promotes pain, lowers pain thresholds, promotes spontaneous pain. 
Uh, and um, it seems that these, uh, these processes reinforce the, each other. Uh, and Genesis was able to, um, to learn how we are measuring um, the uh, uh, sleep wake cycle in mice uh, under conditions of chronic pain. And of course, the, the next steps are uh, to identify uh, the brain circuits that are mediating these effects and then to find um, the transmitters and the mechanisms that can be targeted to normalize sleep and perhaps by normalizing sleep to improve pain. Okay, yeah. Any questions for anyone here? If not, uh, we're gonna go on and uh, Juan, when you edit, uh, get rid of all my prompts. Oh, I see that Pablo, Pablo is here. Maybe he wants to comment. He started out as a high school student in Dr. Pareka's lab and he's now a master's student there and a mentor. So do you have a comment, Pablo? Yeah, just great job, Genesis. Uh, she definitely put in the work and, uh, and research required to understand the complicated experiments we have here in lab. She asked lots of questions this summer. Uh, so just tremendously proud and, uh, and uh, great to see yet another student learn um, a lot this summer. Okay, thank you. If I could just add, great job, Genesis. That's terrific. All right, we're gonna go on to the last presentation from Dr. Bandera's lab. Uh, and that is uh, Ethan Villarreal and Isabella Villarreal. We have a couple of brothers and a brother and a sister in the program. And they are from Perry High School. And where is that located, Perry? It's in Gilbert. Where is it? In Gilbert. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead then. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, my name is Isabella Villarro. I'm a rising senior at Perry High School. Hello, my name is Ethan Villarro. I am also a rising senior at Perry High School and we're going to discuss the effects of compounds on motor coordination of rats. Our our lab mentor is Dr. Vandera, who is a professor and head of pharmacology at the University of Arizona. Our lab focuses primarily on preclinical research regarding potential treatments for pain using both in vitro and in vivo methods. We also investigate metabolic pathways behind pain in order to better understand how exactly pain works while searching to find new compounds that help treat pain. Um, the ability to understand the pain and its effects on the body is crucial to developing medications that don't interfere with other body functions, such as motor functions. This type of function deals with movement and includes the ability to walk, balance, and crawl. Our initial questions included, what is a rotor rod and what is it used for? What are the side effects of the testing compounds? What does ignorance mean and what does our lab research on? Our project question states, using the rotor rod, what is the effect of different compounds on rat motor coordination? In response to our first question, a rotor rod is a piece of equipment used to test a rodent's motor function following the administration of a compound. To pass this performance test, the rats need to maintain equilibrium over a horizontal rod rotating at a constant speed for a minimum of three minutes. If a rod falls off before the three minute mark, a sensor at the bottom of the apparatus will record the total time spent on the rod and ending the testing phase. The compounds tested in the experiment included vehicles, morphine sulfate, alprazolam, flumazenol with vehicle, and flumazenol with alprazolam. Flumazenol is a GABA receptor antagonist which counteracts the effects of alprazolam. Here we have the exact amounts measured for the rats to get injected. Before any testing began, appropriate and skilled handling was implemented to make the rodents feel safe and secure, prevent staff from being injured, avoiding any stress factors from occurring, and ensuring that procedures were carried out efficiently. Now, once the rats were handled, three training sessions took place to ensure that the rats stay on the rotor rod for at least three minutes. During session one, the rotor rod was set to zero RPM. For session two, four RPM. 
in session 3A or PM. The animals were given four attempts to pass a session. If they failed to do so, they were excluded from further testing. Now, this is the data table for training in our lab notebook with three sessions. This shows certain scenarios that have occurred throughout training. For instance, rat number seven did not pass the four attempts, but after a five minute break, he had another go and passed. Rat 11 did not pass and ended up failing, not making it to the official testing of the experiment. From that, we added rat number 16 as a replacement. And the majority of the rats passed session two at 4 p.m., leading to session three of majority passing the first attempt of eight RPMs, clearing them to go to testing. Now on test day, the rats started at a baseline of eight RPMs to assess balance and motor coordination. And if they passed, one of the research specialists injected each rat with a different compound. After receiving the injection, the rats were tested at 30 and again at 30 minutes. Now this is an example of a data table we did for testing on a completely different set of rats from the training example, the vial color represents what dose the rats received. And the reason for the vial color is so Bell and I don't be biased against the compounds affecting the rats on the road run before any testing has started is a blind side test. The amount is the dosage of MLs we give to the specific weight of the rat with some varying. But for any injection, the rats did the baseline test with all of them passing the first attempt at three minutes, leading, leading to them all passing on the road rod at the 30 minute mark. For the 60 minute mark with the road rat, surprisingly rat number 11 did not pass, only lasting 30 minutes, 30 seconds, sorry, with the others passing the three minutes. This is the official data table for all the testing done through June 9th, 16th, and 18th. Seeing all of these results from the compounds, here we can see the results from each baseline, along with the average. We can also see when the rats were given a prazolam and tested again at 30 minutes. We can also see a decrease in the numbers. Um, in Alprazolam, we can see 12, 2, 3, 6, and 18 seconds. At 60 minutes again, we can also see a decrease in motor function compared to the other compounds, but not to the, not to the same low extent as the other 30 minutes after injecting the oprazolam. Analysis of the data showed that oprazolam greatly affected the rat's motor function by hindering their ability to stay on the rod for three minutes. However, when the antagonist fumazinol was administered along with oprazolam, their motor function was unaffected. This is because fumazinol is a GABA antagonist and counteracts the effects of benzodiazepine, such as oprazolam. Furthermore, graph analysis showed that the vehicle alone and the fumazinol plus the vehicle had no significant effect on the rat's motor function. On the contrary, morphine did affect their motor function, just not at the same severity as the oprazolam. Overall, the data showed that the antagonist fumazinol was a positive compound that restored motor function in the rodents. Therefore, we can conclude that flumazenol alleviates the side effects of oprazolam. Our remaining questions we had after completing and analyzing the results of the experiment were, if morphine was tested at a lower dose, would it affect motor function? Is there an antagonist for morphine that would improve motor function without interfering with the analgesic effects? And if flumazenol was paired with oprazolam, would it alleviate the pain in the rodents? And lastly, if the rodents were in pain, which compound tested in our experiment, if any, would be most effective? So what we plan to do with the questions is to research more on the mechanisms of the compounds, test different doses of morphine sulfate, and look back at our previous experiment to gather new results. Our fringe benefits include, or before I say that, even though this research was not directly involved with pain, we observed the potential side effects of multiple drugs by examining the rat's motor function on the road rat. Making, this observ making these observations is crucial when developing a drug because it must not have any adverse side effects that intervene with human daily activities. Assessing the cognitive aspects of pain is important in developing analgesics that don't impose the risk of tolerance and dependence, fear of addiction, and these types of drugs need to be tested before they 
before they are safely distributed to the public. Overall, this experience has taught us how to properly handle the rats, analyze and interpret data, ask probing questions, and accept and understand our ignorance. Uh, so for our acknowledgements, we would both like to thank the NIH SEMI program, Dr. Witte, Grace Wagner, and Gracie Ann Thompson. Along with Ms. Rosemary Alvarado, the Vandera Lab, Dr. Vandera, Kelly, and Sally. Thank you. Any questions? Did you guys observe any side effects uh, after the use of flumazenil? Say that again. Did you guys observe any side effects uh, with the use of flumazenil? Yes, it blocked out the compound of alprazolam and it made the rat uh, able to withhold motor function and last the three minutes. Okay. Well, uh, I think we've completed the first day of SIMI 2021 presentations and uh, it really was flawless. Really outstanding presentations, outstanding formatting, uh, PowerPoints, et cetera. So uh, tomorrow we'll have the remaining presentations, but everyone should be coming uh, and attend all of the uh, sessions tomorrow. And at the end of the session, we'll have the remaining uh, videos. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Thank Dr. Reddy. Did you have anything? Don't you forget to your Oh, I'm time sorry. Piece. Todd is here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just wanted to say thanks to you, to Grace, to everybody organizing. Ethan, Isabella, great job. So always, always good to test these things. I think most students probably know the drug is Xanax. You probably heard of that drug, right? It's a drug that's being abused, unfortunately. And they did some important stuff to try to determine. We always have troubles figuring out whether drugs actually really inhibit pain or do they just lose the motor control because it's kind of like a false positive. And so what they did was really important work to figure out whether Xanax would change motor function because we know that's not good for relieving pain. So great job, guys. And thanks, Dr. Weddy. I'm sorry, Todd. No worries. <laughs> we edit everything out, so we're going to put you before the end. Don't worry. We'll, <laughs> we'll fiddle with the, with, the, with the recording. But no this worries. was absolutely remarkable presentations, Todd. If you get a chance, you can just go through all of them. I mean, they're, they're, practic they're faculty level. Excellent. So very consistent, well, uh, well illustrated, really articulately done. For many of you, I know it's the first time you ever got up in front of an audience. And this is much more than doing a poster, Todd. I think this is really important. A poster you can get help with and it goes up on a wall. But here you had to present this, you had to answer the questions, you had to develop the slides you wanted to use and so on. And to me, it's a much more uh, uh, labor intensive and intellectual accomplishment that you all have done. So congratulations to yeah, you. Yeah, and I'll just add to that. Congratulations, guys. And I hope to see you all in the future in some, some different program that we're a part of. Yeah, well, I think a few of them are going to be back. A few Good. of them are have been back since they were high school students. As you know, Pablo has been yep. now a master's student. He was once a high school student. We have MD, PhDs, uh, MD PhDs who were once high school students and yep. so on. Okay. Uh, so that's the exciting part. What was that, uh, Grace? Yes. He's on the phone. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Uh, and Todd, we had Sean Mackey uh, came to do a presentation for the group, and he recalled his time uh, as an MD-PhD student, because we didn't have an MD-PhD program then. And right. we actually put together various stipends that allowed him really to finish that. And uh, he was very reminiscent, very reminiscent of learning the lessons of ignorance and how he started out in electrophysiology and yeah. how he's evolved uh, as really one of the world's uh, pain experts. Yeah. So that was very thrilling to, to see that and hear it that. It really is. And I think I'm looking at many of you uh, experts in the future. So again, this is sort of where people like uh, 
Dr. Mackey started. So I hope to see you all in the future in things like PhD programs or MD programs or other types of programs, so. Okay, so thank you very much, all of you. And we'll see you tomorrow, all of you, with your videos on. Great, you are muted. <laughs> Oh, Grace has something to say, but she's muted. Yeah, just uh, students, timesheets. Thank you. We'll see you tomorrow. Great work, everyone. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to Shri?